Good morning and welcome to season two of The Review. In this week's episode, we are diving into a wonderful conversation with Kristen Olenek from Tarek and Nama as we talk about influence and influence particularly in the Kanama world. I think there's an underlying belief in this community that you need to be big, you need to have lots of followers, and you need to be sponsored to have an impact in this space. And fundamentally, I don't believe that to be true. And I'm super excited to bring Kristen on here to get her insight into the matter, as Kristen has played quite an incredible role in building up the Kanama community without having to have a big face in the community. Kristen is the chief designer and the co-owner of Terra Kanama, one of my favorite brands based out of Vancouver, Canada, originally out of Cal- or not Calgary, Edmonton, uh, my, my home province. And I'm just genuinely very excited to dive into this conversation that I think is so important for people to grasp. And ultimately, I hope that at the end of this conversation that we all come to a better understanding of what it means to have influence and how we can all be contributing to the growth of this space together, regardless of how big of a platform we have, regardless of the voice that we have, regardless of the tools and the skill sets and all the things that we think we need to be able to make an impact in this world of Kendama. So that is what I'm super excited for today. We're going to be diving in here shortly. But before we do, as always, guys, you know that I love to know what you are drinking this morning. I brewed a fresh cup of AeroPress. It was a... Bur- no, what did I order? It was a Rwandan. A Rwandan coffee that I just picked up this morning from Euphoria Coffee, which is a little little coffee shop near where I live. Uh, and admittedly, it was, it was a bit of an odd experience. I went to go pick up a cappuccino this morning because I ran out of coffee. And I wanted to pick one up and pick up a bag. Uh, and so I go there and I'm like, I'm chipper. I'm a little grumpy because I haven't picked up my coffee. It's like 9 a.m. I roll in and the buddy who's working there, I like walk in and I'm, I'm videoing myself coming in. I'm trying to give them a little promo, a little feature. And so I put up a little euphoria on my story. And buddy, <laughs> I think he saw that and he thought I was just another trolling influencer on Instagram. And he definitely gave me a like, Oh yeah, what do you what what kind of coffee you want? And gave me a like, <laughs> I don't know if he was new or if he was grumpy, but definitely didn't think I knew anything about coffee. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna I'd love a traditional cappuccino, and I'm gonna pick up a bag of beans. And he's like, oh yeah, what do you want some dark roast beans and stuff? And I was like, dude, I'm coming to a third wave coffee shop. No one's getting dark roast here. Come on, don't troll me like this. Don't troll me. <laughs> Anyways. It was a bitter experience. We all needed a little cup of coffee before that. Uh, Before we dive in, a couple things I wanted to say. Uh, First off, I wanted to say that I'm very thrilled to announce that I made it to the semifinals of the No Pro Open. I normally don't like to talk about these things, but I was really happy to, to perform as well as I did this weekend in the No Pro Open. I came fourth overall, I made it to the semifinals and lost to two incredible Kanama players, Elijah Lane and Onishi. And congratulations to Peter who ultimately took first place in the competition. It was quite a fun experience for me. I definitely did not expect to do as well as I did and I'm just happy to put on for Canada and for the coffee gang. Uh, Thank you so much to all of you guys who showed up and supported me in the journey. I went into the chat after my matches and I just saw all the love in there, and I am so grateful for all of you guys. Uh, Secondly, I wanted to say that next week is a really special week for the Brewview. Next week is the one-year anniversary of this show. It means that we've been doing this show for about 52 episodes. It's been a full year of caffeinated conversations where we talk to your favorite influencers, brand owners, and Kanama players over the warmth of coffee, and we really dive into these behind-the-scenes, behind-the-ken stories. And so there's going to be something a little special. If you are uh, um, if you are a Patreon, which costs you five dollars a month American to get behind the scenes access, you're actually going to get some content early. We recorded a really special episode of the review for next week ahead of time. It's not going to be live, and it's only going to be available on Patreon for the first week, and it's going to be live this upcoming weekend. There's no live recording going on. There's not going to be a recorded episode this upcoming weekend, and it will only be available on Patreon, and it's in a video format, and will also come in uh, audio format there. So that's going to be coming up this weekend. It will be made publicly available the week after, but I'm going to be taking a week off from review afterwards to just rest, recoup, and reset for the new year of review, or the second anniversary, or moving into the second year. Anyways, there's going to be a lot more to say, and I just wanted to say a humble thank you to all of you who have supported the review so far. 
we have surpassed over 50,000 in total views, listens, watches, downloads of this show in a year, which is absolutely astronomical. And there are some really cool things coming up this next week. Not only is there a special episode of The Review coming, but we're going to be doing a big giveaway. And I want to leak a little bit of the details, but I want to be a little bit sus about it too, because I think it's really fun. There's going to be an epic giveaway next week regarding the celebration of the one-year anniversary of Review. It for sure is going to be including one of these mugs. It's going to be including a bag of coffee from one of my favorite coffee roasters. It may or may not include a kendama that is associated with kendama or with coffee. And it is also a sponsored giveaway from a really big brand that I am incredibly stoked about. And it is not a Kanama brand. And I had no expectations when I reached out to this company about sponsoring this giveaway. And they were pumped. They were stoked and they are a part of it. And I can't wait to tell you. The Patreon members already know because I shared about it on my story. So if you want to know early and get an insight into the giveaway, subscribe on the Patreon and support the show. With all that said, uh, last thing I want to say is we are about to dive into this conversation. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask Kristen today as we dive into Kanama design, influence, Terra Kanama, Vancouver, the Canadian Kanama scene, and all of that goodness, drop those down in the Q&A tool below and we will be diving into your questions in today's episode. So without further ado, let's get Kristen on here and let's dive into this week's episode of The Brew View. If you guys could join me by tapping that heart button down below as we welcome Kristen, Kristen. onto the show. Hi. Kristen, <laughs> welcome here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it is my privilege and my pleasure. How are you doing today? Good. You know, morning. Just relaxing. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you at the Terra shop or what? what is this? What no, is this... It? This is our apartment. <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys got a forest in there. What's going on there? Oh yeah, no, I could literally point to any corner in this place and you'd <laughs> find a plant of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a few plants in my room, but they're all fake because I am oh, yeah. a terrible, what is it, botanist? Is is that what it's called? Uh, someone who looks yeah, after plants? horticulturist maybe? Hort horticulturist, or yeah. Botanist, I, yeah. yeah. Whatever I it's know. called, I'm bad at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, this one is actually uh, thanks to Alex. One of our neighbors was moving out and noticed that we had a ton of plants and was talking to him. And he's like, you want a corn plant? Like, it's been alive for like 41 years. Like, have what? it. And we just got that's it. For, a for that's been alive for 41 years? Apparently, yeah. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> and we kind of just adopted it like maybe a month ago. So. That's crazy. Yeah. I okay, so I love plants, but and I and I like I long okay, so here's the thing. Here's a little selfish selfish thing in my life. I would long mm -hmm. to marry someone who is a plant person <laughs> that would be more than willing to look after them because I love plants. Like I, mm -hmm. I truly do. I love the benefits and the effects and the mood boosting properties of just having better oxygenation in your house. Yeah. Like that that's huge for me. But I kill plants like crazy. My mom got me a Christmas <laughs> cactus. Like, do you know what a Christmas cactus is? Yep. Yeah. Okay, my, so mom my mom had a ton of them. Yeah. Right, right, right. And they don't die, right? They're, they're no. pretty hard to kill. I killed mm -hmm. one within a month. And, oh, and like wow. my mom gave it to me and she's like, come on, Adam, this one's easy. This one's not even hard. <laughs> and and it, it was hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I never had a chance. My mom, when I tell my mom about how many plants I have here, she's like, oh, and when I was in like second year, like college, I had 41 plants or something in one room. I was like, oh, oh my yeah. gosh. No, I never had a chance. I, I am a plant person. I love it. <laughs> I know. I, I got to get into it. I, I, I have a feeling that there's probably a good overlap. If you were to take a Venn diagram, of people that play kanama and people that are plant people and there's probably a pretty good population in there that are kanama players and plant people that's just my guess i, I like see that like you know kind of like organic culture in kanama of people <coughs> sorry one second <coughs> oh coffee went down the wrong way yeah so, coffee's yeah. hitting hard today yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so actually let's dive in, let's dive in here what are, what are you yeah. drinking this morning i am drinking sorry Ooh. Some coffee that uh, Alex's parents actually gave us from Edmonton. I don't know. I have no idea what this uh, coffee roaster is, but Catfish. Okay, roaster. that's from Edmonton? Yeah, yeah, from Edmonton. Oh, yeah, no way. They, they sent it to us. So it's the first time I'm trying it, and it's really good. I, I, I have all the gear for a coffee snob, but I know very little about coffee. So, <laughs> what what uh, kind of gear do you have? Uh, I have a Chemex. Ooh. Alex got that for, uh, for my birthday, actually, this year. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, have you have you tried doing an iced Chemex yet? 
No, I haven't. I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> okay, super, super easy. Uh, do, yeah. you want, do you want the quick breakdown? Dama or Death sure. uh, actually gave me the best recipe I've ever used for mm -hmm. making iced Chemex. And this is, this is the short recipe for making it for two people. So yeah. you and Alex, if you, you want to make some ice pour over together, mm -hmm. this is how you do it. You take 450 grams of ice, you put it in mm -hmm. the Chemex, and then you're going to grind up 60 grams of coffee. So 60 grams of beans. And you want them like kind mm -hmm. of a medium fine, probably what you would normally be grinding anyways, or if you get it pre-ground, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you take 60 grams, you're going to put that in your filter, and then you're going to do 450 grams in total of water into the top. So 450 grams of ice, 450 grams of water, and then 60 grams of beans and mm -hmm. hot water. Yeah. Uh, so bring that to, you know, just below boiling, 98 degrees, 96 degrees or thereabouts. And you're going to do a little bloom. 100 mm -hmm. grams of water in, bloom it for 30 seconds, and then you're going to do a couple pours to reach up to that 450. Do like 100 okay, grams yeah. at a time until you hit 450. It should take about five to seven minutes, but I've been doing mm -hmm. this like at least once every like two or three days. The best iced Chemex recipe right. I've ever had in my life. Big shout outs to Dama or Death mm -hmm. on IG for teaching me that one. Yeah, that's amazing. I am definitely going to have to try that because... Yeah, I've been very much experimenting with the Chemex. I know very little about it, but it's amazing coffee. I actually just yes. finally got paper filters again because like, you know, oh. like everything, paper filters were like, yeah. you know, more like rare than gold. So uh, it was I, ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking about that a couple <laughs> months back on the show yeah. where <laughs> where I was going through a Chemex crisis because I, I had no filters. I ran yeah. out and you couldn't buy them anywhere. No, and, I, I had to buy a metal like Kona filter. I think yeah, it was. yeah. Yeah. So I bought that one and I, I used that for like a few months and it was great. It's just it's not the same as paper filters. So I know. yesterday I finally got some and I was like, oh, man, I, I was missing this. Yeah, yeah. It, it was crazy. I, <laughs> it was like one of those like first world privilege things that I realized totally. that I was so dependent <laughs> on. I was like, dang, yeah. I don't have any filters and I can't go buy any. Because all of the, the paper manufacturers converted into making toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's awesome. Uh, oh, that's so yeah. cool. Okay, so Kristen, uh, mm -hmm. I like to ask three questions usually before we get started. I always ask, what are you drinking today? But the second one I always want to know is if you could go back or in time or today Teach anyone their first spike, past or present, oh. alive or dead, who would it be? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's... Mm. I'm trying to think of some really influential woman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Do you think oh, Mich man. Michelle Obama has touched a I d Actually, oddly enough, I don't know why. We're both Canadian, and of course, the first person we thought of was Michelle Obama. <laughs> she's, like, she's like the power woman that everybody yeah. knows. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess in, in lieu of someone else, for sure. Yeah, like okay. Michelle Obama, let's do that. Some very okay. influential woman who like could see the potential to just like for, for Kendama and to spread it to, to more people. And yeah, there she wrote a book about it too. And it would she be would, a New yeah. York <laughs> Times bestseller. Absolutely. Do you, yeah. do you think she'd be good at Kendama? Like just like innately looking at Michelle Obama, do you think she'd be a shredder? Uh, I have no idea, but she could. <laughs> <laughs> she could, I, I feel she like could. she's got it i think she could i you know she, she's she got some style i think she could pull it off she'd totally. be i think she'd get into the flow style of kanama yeah. she'd be old school og flow i yeah, can see it happening mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, i want to know uh, for you today uh kristen who is the most inspiring player today not of all time but just like right now in this moment of history for me um yeah for you Honestly, uh, I actually had a couple. Pro mm. Kendama Fufu is like really blowing mm. my mind these days. I like not necessarily because they're doing insanely difficult tricks, but they, you know, as a designer and as someone who really appreciates art, like they are creating art with Kendama. And I think that's incredible. So, uh, yeah, no, the, everything that I've seen of theirs is like just blows my mind and is so inspiring to me so yeah mm. i pick them do you okay i i know they go by kanama fufu but mm -hmm. do you know their actual names like individually uh i actually just looked at their instagram last night i think it's i i could really be wrong here but mia and taco maybe um i know okay. that it has that on their profile so i don't actually know i haven't interacted with them at all so i don't actually know but um yeah yeah, they're, they're, I, I would assume if that's on their profile, that's those are their names. 
Yeah. yeah, they're like hidden gems in the community because mm -hmm. I, I think in a unique way, they have so much clout because of what they do, but yeah. they're not people that people know. They're just like doing this content mm -hmm. out there that everybody appreciates and values and it's so wonderful, beautiful, it's brilliantly put together, but I feel yeah. like no one actually knows them like yeah. personally except maybe the people around rice them does. And, yeah 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 obviously matt rice does and, and i'm sure he was stoked to see all the content they were putting yeah. out because that was a huge lift for for deal with it obviously it was so cool watching their uh their christmas uh series where they were yeah. doing the the uh, what did they call it they had a series name for it but it was wonderful um, people should go back and watch it i don't it. remember yeah yeah definitely no, honestly rice also has like just a knack for picking incredible like Kendama players that I'm just so inspired by because another one is Kozarov. Like, yes. Steph will laugh at me if she sees this because every single time I just like I love I'm, I fangirl so hard with Kozarov. It's like the one time <laughs> ever that I fangirl. But yeah, no, she's she's amazing. Just like it's performance art, and I love it. And like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's awesome. Well, hey, Kristen, I am super excited to have you on the preview. Mm -hmm. I've been wanting to get you on for a little bit. And we had a little chat beforehand about, you know, what, what we wanted to talk about in getting you on here. And, and ultimately, I want to dive into a deep conversation a little bit later into mm -hmm. what influences, especially in the Kanama community, because I, I have this underlying belief, and I think you and I shared this, is that you don't need to have a big platform or a big face in Kanama or be the best at the tricks or whatever to actually have an impact in this space. Mm -hmm that yeah. you can go ahead and make a wave in this community without needing to have 2000 plus followers and winning comps and all these things. And I think that mm -hmm. so many people can learn from that mentality. And then we, if ultimately, I think that if we as a community can adopt that mentality, we're going to see so much more growth. We're going to see yeah. a lot more empowerment in the space. More mm -hmm. people are going to step up to the plate. We're going to see more stuff happen. Honestly, if I had the mindset that I needed to be this big name to start this platform called The Review, I never would have started it. Yeah. This wouldn't have happened. And now I'm, I'm just grateful for where it is. And so I want to get into your mindset as well, because you have had a huge impact in the community uh, through the All Girls Kanama Open, through your role at Terra Kanama, and just in the community in general, you have played an incredible role in empowering so many people's lives. And I've seen that even in the comments mm. that came out on the post when I posted this, <laughs> of all these influential people that I see that admire you so much. And so I want to really dive into that today. But oh, before you. we get into that, <laughs> uh, I want to know more about you. Where are you from? Like, you aren't from Vancouver originally, right? No, I'm also from Edmonton. Alex and I are both from Edmonton. Yeah. Alberta. <laughs> Alberta Pride. <laughs> okay, so you're Edmonton born, born and raised? Yep, yep. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, How long did you live there for? You moved to Van, what, a couple years back? Uh, I actually moved to Calgary first. I oh. was, um, yeah, I lived in Edmonton for most of my life. I went to school, um, like university there. I also went to university in a lot of other places. But um, yeah, so I, it was probably in... 2010 so I would have been 20 um I moved to Calgary for two years to finish my degree at ACAD actually um on state so yeah. I lived yeah I lived there for a couple of years uh and then after that I moved to Vancouver to do a master's program here so that was in 2012 yeah so yeah I was I was doing yeah. a little skim through your profile and I found it a little ways down. You were doing a master's in architecture, right? Yes. Yeah. And yeah, you're UBC. finished now. Yes, I am. Yeah. I have been, oh. uh, I graduated in 2017. So it's, uh, wow, it's been five years, whole, almost five years. Now. Yeah. That's crazy. That's incredible. Doesn't so you, did, that long. <laughs> you just finished your, not just finished, but in 2017, you finished your master's yeah. in architecture. Before that you did an, uh, your uh, degree in, in. Yeah. In Edmonton, it was a uh, diploma in like um, design and photography, like technical design, like commercial design and photography. And then ACAD, I transferred and finished my Bachelor of Design um, also in photography, but with more of a fine arts like focus. So yeah. What, what does that mean uh, in terms of like the fine arts side of that? Uh, it's a lot more like, you know, uh, the, the technical um, degree was more like actually technically like learning about like light properties and commercial design and like learning like programs and physically how to like you know run like a, a like a press file to like a printing company and stuff mm -hmm. um the fine acad was a lot more conceptual um it was a lot more like concept like idea creation and like communication of like how do we communicate art it was very much art instead of uh instead of design even though it was it was a 
bachelor of design. So um, Interesting. very different focuses. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's super cool. So how did you get into design in the first place? Like, where did that where did that kickstart for you? Oh, man, I kind of always loved it. Um, as a kid, like, I, I actually always really wanted to be an architect as a kid. Uh, I had Lego, uh, and I would just build houses and movie theaters <laughs> and swimming pools and stuff with Lego. And, uh, and then one, I, I met like a family friend who was an architect. And he told me like the worst thing possible when I was like 10 years old. He's like, Oh, all you do is paperwork. And I was like, Oh, what? no, that's not what you tell a 10 year old when they want to no. be an architect. So I'd like kind of like abandoned that idea for a little while. And uh, my parents just thought I was going to go into sciences at in university. I was like, you know, doing full sciences, calculus, all of that in, um, mm -hmm. in high school. And then I just, I realized I was like, I don't want to do this. Like I love design. I love being creative. And I told my mom like, you know, halfway through grade 12 that I was like, I'm going to, I want to do photography. I want to like get a, a degree in photography and I could just tell my mom tried to be very stoic but I could tell that she was just like her jaw like hit the floor being like, Ooh, hmm. are you sure okay yeah let's do it and uh and then halfway into my first year she immediately said like yes like 100 percent you this is absolutely like where you needed to be um and then I at the end of my degree when I I thought I was just like going sideways when I decided I wanted to do a master's in architecture and I turned to my mom expecting the same sort of reaction and she just went no yeah of course like mm. I, I knew you were gonna do this I knew you were gonna continue it's like you just had to like get on that path so uh yeah design's kind of always been in in my life I've always loved it um yeah I, I can't imagine doing anything else so yeah w was that hard for you not you know when when your mom wasn't necessarily super supportive at first what was that I like mean, she you? she she was supportive but i okay. could tell that she i mean she and my stepdad are both in in medicine like she is right. a phd nurse she's the dean of like nursing at u of a um my stepdad was like you know an emergency physician they were both in health sciences and so i could tell that they they both like had a had a soft spot for that and we're like oh it'd be great if you know Kristen's so good at science like she could she could go into health sciences so I could tell that like that's what they they you know kind of wanted but my mom has always told me like you can do anything you want like I will support mm -hmm. you in that so I, I knew that she would say that like when I when I went to her but I could tell that she was a little bit reserved of like okay well let's see where this goes kind of thing. yeah the, the classic parent so, just like wanting the best for their kid in terms of like yeah. we want we want to make sure our kid is like financially equipped yeah. to, to live in the world <laughs> after they move out mm -hmm. and and there's this like classic misconception that if you go into like a fine arts or liberal arts or just mm -hmm. whatever degree that like you're just destined to not make money yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like sorry mm -hmm. yeah let's uh, yeah. let's take 60 grand out of your bank account for the next exactly. couple of years and then uh and then you know you're gonna get none of it back <laughs> right i know yeah so i definitely um i it, it was you know as much as i knew that she she would support me 100 mm -hmm. it was very validating like you know a, even just a few months into my first year to have her say like yes hunt like i this you know if i ever had doubts i don't have them now this is like where you're meant to be so, yeah so yeah so at that point in time did you have a physical outlet for your design uh you know desires outside of school because obviously you were into design and you were mm -hmm. into art and the fine arts and all those things uh did you have an outlet or event where you were exercising that was Terra already existent in your life or were there, there uh, other things yeah i mean when i when i first started university we hadn't um when did we 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 found kingdom i found kingdom like right around the time that alex did because you know we were dating we were together mm -hmm. and um so that would have been, we would have been like 18 or 19. So I would have been in like university for about a year at that point. Um, but yeah, Tara really was kind of the, the or, or just Kendama in general, even before Tara, it was Kendama Edmonton. Um, that really was like a huge outlet of like design um, for mm -hmm. me. Before that, I had, I had other projects, but nothing I, honestly, nothing I can even really remember at this point. So it wasn't that significant. Um, but yeah, like, Kendama, at first the UKA, the University Kendama Association, which I think Alex yeah. kind of talked about. Yeah, he yeah. did. He started his own club. Like, on yeah. campus. were you a part of starting that? Uh, I wasn't like, I didn't 
started, it was him and Ben, but I definitely like helped like put on the contest that they had. And I filmed there's, we actually, Alex and I just watched it again last night. There's a couple of videos from those like contests that I filmed and like, it, you know, so yeah. I was, I was around for it for sure. Yeah. But he even put out a booklet um, that was kind of like, you know, I'm as good for your health. And like with like some tricks and stuff that I helped, I took photos and like helped him lay it out. Cause of course I was in design school. So like any sort of like real world application for design, I was like jumped on it. So yeah, that, yeah. like, and then Kendama Edmonton, all those videos uh, pretty much from like edit, seven onwards um yeah i filmed like helped film all of those and put them together like alex and i would like collab on editing them and yeah so that was uh -huh. that was probably a, one of the biggest like first real outlets for design where i could see my design like taking form and actually like living in like the real world and in some you know tangible way mm -hmm. so and, and that's a different type of validation too like i know that mm -hmm. when you're in school and okay so you create a business plan or whatever you're like degree yeah. that you're doing and you do an assignment and you get a grade back on it. There's a sense of validation there, but when you mm -hmm. actually put something out into the, like the quote unquote real world yeah. and then real customers or real people are giving you feedback and they're like, this is dope. This is sick. This is whatever. Like that's yeah. a different kind of validation that Definitely. feels so cool. Yeah. And so you, you got to play a role in the Kanama Edmonton. So hold on, let me geek mm -hmm. out for like one second. Yeah. The Kanama Edmonton crew, <laughs> is back and it's alive and it's thriving that, and there's a whole new generation That's there amazing. and it's so cool yeah it's amazing <laughs> I, to hear that <laughs> yeah do you know any of the people that are still uh, like up and active there like uh there's ray bulato and thomas oh, boyvin yeah. and ray bulato i definitely recognize that name. i don't actually know if i've met him but i i definitely recognize the name like for sure yeah Oh, th yeah. those guys are back at it again and they're mm -hmm. playing. They were break dance. They are break dancers. Oh, so yeah, they, yeah, they're yeah. like, uh, dude, and their style is so sick. They got like the classic OG Dave Mateo style flow. Yes. You name it. Uh, Lachlan down in the chat, actually, he's a Kanama Edmonton shredder as well. Uh, <laughs> he has been popping off. Like he has gained so much confidence in his play that I've seen recently. Mm -hmm. Like the Kanama Edmonton. Hold, let me just like shout out to the Alberta squad right now because it's, it's, <laughs> It's elevating. It's definitely yeah. like coming back to life. I That's think, amazing. you know, I'm, I'm proud to say I've played a little role in helping rebuild the <laughs> Calgary scene and the Edmonton scene. And I'm just so excited. Mm -hmm. It's so fun to see it come back to life. Because I remember yeah. when I started playing, uh, I was in Saskatchewan when I first started playing Kanama. And I had mm -hmm. seen what was happening in Alberta. And I felt like I was missing out. Because yeah. this is where everybody was in Canada, outside of maybe Ontario and Vancouver. And mm -hmm. I was just alone. And I saw all of this stuff <laughs> happening. And I was like, Alex Smith. And, and I, at this point, I didn't even know who you were. And we're going to get into that because you actually mm -hmm. played such a pivotal role in developing Tara and Alex and all of these people that are, you know, the quote unquote influencers of this space. <laughs> but you, you were really a part of that the whole time. And, and it's just, it was just something humbling now for me to be a part of. And I, I'm just curious, you know, yeah. are, are you proud of where it is today and like being a part of that? Yeah, honestly, like, uh, again, like kind of prepping for this, just going back over like all of that. Um, Alex and I watched all of the Kanama Edmonton edits like from le last night. And uh, where, where it was are just they? So, they're, just... um, it, on YouTube, it's a Kendama Edmonton, like is the channel or whatever. Okay. So they're not, uh, they're not on Terra's, but yeah. So if you search Kendama Edmonton on YouTube, they pop up and uh, they were so just nostalgic because it was, it was really like taking it back to a time. Like I didn't realize until last night again that uh we filmed like four or five of those in one summer i was like how did we have this much time and i was like oh wait we were like university students like you know on summer vacation with nothing else to do it's like this is what how we filmed that many in one summer and uh they were just so nostalgic and like wonderful it was a, it was a really great era of kendama for me personally because it was just so like new and exploratory and a, a great creative outlet where I was, you know, I was learning all of these like new design ideas in school and actually getting to like put them into use, like in, you know, mm -hmm. a silly creative way. And yeah, it was, it was a great time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. And I mean, looking back at that time, you know, when, when I was in uh, college and I think when most people look back when they're in like high school or college and university, it's like, you don't realize how much free time you actually have to put into yeah. these other side projects that when you finally like go into working full time and you got your mm -hmm. bills and whatever, it's like, oh man, filming and edits kind of scary now. Yeah. Yeah. 
but there was also just such a like euphoric sense of new back then yeah, where it was definitely. something new and obviously you experienced that you were creating designs and it was just something that had momentum behind it and you were a part mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. and and you got to exercise a lot of stuff and so yeah talk talk me through a little bit of the development both in your personal life in that university college scene and uh, mm -hmm. kanama edmonton and your design oh man uh i mean a lot of it, like, really, like, Kanama Edmonton, it was just kind of, like, this is a fun, like, outlet, like, whatever. That I, I didn't really think that it was, at the time, I didn't think it was that connected to design, but it obviously is. And in retrospect, I, I recognize that. Um, it was more when, like, Kara started, like, forming, because that was probably, that was in, like, 2011. I would have been in, like, third year at uh, McEwen, so I was kind of, like, and, you know, I, I'd been in, like, design for a, a couple of years, like, in actual, like, school. Mm -hmm. Um, well, wait, so you went you went to Grant McEwen. What years did yeah. you go there? Uh, 2007 to 10. Ah. But I was at the I was at the arts campus. So we were they cloistered us all away from everyone else. <laughs> they were just like, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I almost went to Grant McEwen. I got a scholarship really? to go there for nice. their cross country team. I did oh, not nice. want to do cross country. Uh, yeah. Like I, I was I was decent at it, but I like didn't actually love running. <laughs> so I never ended up going, but I almost mm -hmm. went there. I was like, well, oh, maybe I would have overlapped a little bit and I could have been a yeah. part of the Kanama Edmonton story. <laughs> But yeah. not quite. I went. I would have gone just a couple of years after. But mm, yeah. Anyways, sorry. Yeah, no. And uh, but it was more when like yeah, Tara was starting to form. Like Alex and Ben were like putting it together, and they were talking about you know, oh, we played Kanama for a few years. We can start to to make these and everything. And they were just figuring it out as they go, as we all do. And uh, and I remember they were trying to figure out how to like put a website together and how are we going to sell these online and like how are we going to take photos and at the same time i'm like you know right there having like taking web design classes and like ha getting a degree in photography and i was like no, 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 no like step aside step aside let me handle this kind of thing so it was like very much like a i just you know we were figuring it out as we went but um just yeah, like use it like really good timing, odd, oddly enough, just because uh, I was going through all this in school and learning it. And it was like so fresh in my mind that it was a, it was a great outlet. So, yeah, mm -hmm. design school really pushes you and tests like your your idea about like absolutely every object and everything around you. So it's like, I don't know, I, I kind of like equate it to like when I see like, you know, skaters saying that like everything they see is a handrail. When you're in design school, like everything you see is like an object or or something that was made by another human being that you know like that can be analyzed and interesting and and discussed and and critiqued and figured out and like a lot of the time, really good design is invisible. Like people don't notice yeah. it until it goes wrong, <laughs> until it's bad. Um, but uh, design school really taught me to to notice the good design, the design that's invisible, that's like, you know, right at your fingertips, like honestly, like a Chemex, like it's so minimal mm -hmm. and it's so like, well, it's so utilitarian. And, yeah, it's the little yeah, subtleties, beautiful. like on a Chemex, it has like that little like nipple thing on it, yeah. uh, the little bump and that's in yeah. intentional so that it holds its integrity. And mm -hmm. like it aesthetically, yeah. sure it fits there, but like everything, everything comes together and pulls a, a yeah. full picture of how everything looks. Mm -hmm. And design is so important. Uh, one, one of the, so I, I'm like big into digital marketing and e-commerce and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was recently in uh, an e-commerce like conference online thing, watching stuff. And they were talking about UX design, like user yeah. experience on websites and all these sorts of things mm -hmm. and how important that stuff is. And sometimes you're like, as a mindset of like an e-commerce, like digital marketer, you're like, okay, if I just have a great <laughs> product and I have the right price and like it, the rest of it doesn't really matter because it's yeah. fine. It'll, it'll just sell because <laughs> it's what people want. But mm -hmm. your user experience and like your load times and all these things, the little subtleties that play really background matters. noise to the front end mm -hmm. are actually the things that matter so much because it can change your conversion rate from, you know, we only convert 1% of every, every 100 people, only one person buys to you just mm -hmm. update your design and you fix that. Now, all of a sudden, you're selling to yeah. five people out of every 100 and now you're way more profitable and you didn't have to, you know, focus on cutting your costs or anything. It was just design. Mm -hmm. It was just how it looks. Yeah, and so uh, like a good example of that too, that's, you know, kind of relates to Kendama, but also everything is um, packaging is like, you know, something that I've like, thought about for a long time. And I, I'm obviously not the first person to think about this. But uh, is, you know, packaging, like, I mean, actually, Apple is probably one of the best companies I've ever seen for this is the user experience of just mm -hmm. how do you open the box? Like, 
you know, just literally opening the box and the products right there. Yeah. It's not like some blister pack that you have to like find scissors and like you cut your mm-hmm. finger when you're opening it up. It's like that experience is really important. Um, as well. That like as airtight you know. pop of the box yeah. when you're lifting up your every yeah, all the of whole, that is the so... whole yeah. The what, what's the process co- of, of that so is is really important and also just like what do you do with the packaging afterwards like do you hold on to it do you just immediately toss it out like you know that like design is so much more than just like the one product that you're uh that you're hoping to sell it's like the entire like lifetime of that product it's the entire lifetime of the experience of buying it and engaging with it yeah it's really important <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about it. I have a, a, my old Apple phone case and I mm-hmm. use that to hold all of my like string repairs, old yeah. stickers, extra strings and stuff. It's because yeah. it's such a like, I don't know, like the aesthetics of the box excel itself has value to it. And A, mm-hmm. if you try to sell an iPhone without a box later, your value goes like... <laughs> Yeah. Everybody, everybody, yeah. <laughs> people in the chat, they're like Adam frantically looking for the box. I am because it's, it's somewhere around me. I just don't know where. I think it's in my drawer over there. But no, mm-hmm. seriously, design is so cool. And I see that even in coffee. I, I, yeah. I'm sure that a lot of my favorite coffee brands don't necessarily taste that much better than another <laughs> brand. But the design and the aesthetics of how I receive the, the coffee, whether mm-hmm. it comes from a website that's been really aesthetically designed, that leads me to buy their product and sign up for yeah. their subscription and then ultimately arriving in this beautiful package and I pop it open and the way that the bag's designed and the whole experience to the moment that I finally pour my cup mm-hmm. and take a sip, I now have an entire layer of subconscious that's on top of my cup of coffee (laughs) that is elevating how it tastes, even though the actual taste isn't any better or worse (laughs) of the product, but because of everything else, I've experienced it so much better. And design, Mm -hmm. that that's design, Uh, right? Yeah. Oh, I geek out, I geek out, oh my gosh, I can't talk. I geek out on this (laughs) hardcore. Okay, so I, I'm curious then. You mm-hmm. you were the f- one who originally designed the Tarek and Nama website, right? Yes. Yeah. Talk to me I about. I still your... do. I still I still work on it. It's like it's never finished. It's always like being updated. So yes, I still do it. Yeah. Always a work in progress. <laughs> Let me first yeah. off say I think the Tarek and Nama website is probably one of the best websites in oh, the Kanama community you. in terms of like the aesthetics and the design and the co- you know like it, it's it's actually been designed by someone who's designing <laughs> you know you can even see it on the on the custom page where it's like create your own dama that page in particular i think is really mm-hmm. really well done from a designer's perspective i Thank think you, you guys have yeah. a very good design in the kanama community for sure uh with that said though talk mm-hmm. to me about that journey of developing the website because you were getting into this in like 20 10 ish yeah yeah uh oh man like our our first website was a big cartel and it was bad it was horrible so you know like you, we all have to start from somewhere too so um yeah, yeah. what was that experience like creating the first website <laughs> as like a, a new designer you're in school you're just learning this for your first time actually um more more hilarious was it were uh like you know, taking and editing the photos of the very first Tarek and Damas that we were releasing when Alex decided that, sorry, one second, Alex, I can hear, yeah, sorry, he's listening to it over there and I can hear it and I can hear my own voice. Sorry, anyway, That's so um, we were, uh, yeah, so he had like the first, I don't know, 10 Kendamas or something that he wanted to put online and like put up for sale. And he announced that they were going to be at, say, 1 p.m. I don't remember when it was exactly. <laughs> but he told me the equivalent of like at noon that we needed photos of them ready and edited. And I'm like, oh, no. OK, so like just like mad dash, like taking photos and like processing them and trying to get them up online is like it's 101 p.m. And everyone is like, <laughs> where are they? They're not where are the like, photos. Yeah. So like. Yeah, the the first the first website, the first like photos, all of that, the, not perfect, and they you know they don't need to be, but like yes, we were quite literally figuring this out as we went along, <laughs> and uh, yeah, the a few of the drops after that got a little bit smoother and a little bit smoother, but uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's always like a learning process. <laughs> so. Did- did yeah. you wrestle with that perfectionism uh, in design? Yeah. Uh, I, I imagine so many designers <laughs> in particular wrestle with perfectionism. And then there's a lot of the like business owners that are like, just, just get it done. It's fine. Just, just yep. put it up. <laughs> did, did, do you have that battle personally? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I've definitely like battled with perfectionism for a long time, but so has Alex. Like Alex and I mm-hmm. both like admit that we, we can be quite perfectionistic like in that, in that sense. So um 
yeah, it's definitely something that we've had to like, just like work on for a long time. It's just like saying like, okay, there's, you know, and the, and even in design, in arts, like all of my props would say this like all the time that um, uh, one, one of my favorite props specifically said like art is done when you say it's done. Cause you, otherwise you could just continue to work on it forever. And you'll, you'll always find like, an extra thing to like add or, or improve or finish. Um, and uh, so at some point you do just have to say like, it's done. It's this, this piece is good. I'm moving on. Um, and same thing with uh, all of the architecture props that I, I talked to. I, there was so much like crossover between all of this, like mm -hmm. um, a ton of my props would say that uh, an artist, like a, an architect's work is never finished because they are always working on the same detail throughout their entire life. You know, it can be across several buildings, several projects, but they're mm. still trying to like perfect that one thing that they're trying to look for. And like each, each design, each building, each like, like photograph gets closer to what they think that like is perfection, but it never quite reaches there. It's, it's very, it's very similar to the concept of like Kaizen. It's just like continual self-improvement. Yeah. It, so, all the cha change is good and yeah. we're always improving. Yeah. And I think, I think, I love that about Kendama, right? There's, you're never going to hit mm -hmm. 10 out of 10. You're never going to be perfect. Yeah. There's never an ultimate, you can always add another Because it's a flip. moving goal. It's a moving goal. Like you think, yeah. you know, like when we literally, when we started Kendama, we literally said out loud several times, like the day I learned to Lunar, it, I'm, it's done. I, I, I mastered Kendama. And it's like, then you realize that there's so much more. So like, it's a, it's a moving goal every single time. But a good yeah. thing, yeah. No, totally, absolutely. And I think that can, there. there's like two ways that you can approach that that philosophy of Kaizen, where mm -hmm. there's no real tangible finish line. You can yeah. either humbly accept that and then proceed mm -hmm. anyways, or yeah. just fall into paralysis and be like, well, if, if there's nothing that I can achieve, you know, ultimately at the end of this, mm -hmm. then I'm just not gonna do anything. And I think yeah. that depending on the type of person you are, you're going to find a lot more joy in life if you humbly accept the fact that you're never going to be perfect and that Very you can always improve. Of you. <laughs> right? Well, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love, I, I've been reading some, a little bit of Stoic philosophy, so I agree with you. <laughs> who, who are you reading? Uh, I've I'm mostly secondary texts, so I haven't actually read okay. like primary texts of Stoic philosophy, but I really, really loved Epictetus, like, and okay. Marcus Aurelius as well, as a, sure. a little bit, but um, yeah, Epictetus, like, was really fascinating so yeah. are, are you studying philosophy or uh, or is no, this leisure just, reading the leisure reading yeah okay. leisure, leisure reading kind of pandemic induced leisure reading <laughs> <laughs> i i love philosophy i i love i used to be a big reader especially in college i went through mm -hmm. one year where i tried to read a book a week outside of my course text which was a very yeah. ambitious goal that ended up sewering a lot of my like headspace during that season. <laughs> yeah. But I made it through like, I think 20 books or something that nice. year, yeah. which was way more than I ever would have read anyways. And I'm grateful mm -hmm. for it. And I read a couple of philosophy books. I don't even remember which ones, but I love philosophy, business philosophy, all that stuff. I just mm -hmm. love nonfiction writing because it, yeah. it helps me to like think more broadly about the world. And mm -hmm. I was just curious uh, what, you know, obviously you, you appreciate that kind of literature. Yeah. Absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. super cool. I think more people should read philosophy. I, I love that. I or psychology. They're one yeah. of my favorite books. Have you read Ma Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl? No, I haven't. I'm going to write that down. Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah, I think it's one of the, the greatest books any, any one person could ever read. Viktor Frankl mm -hmm. was a psychologist. He was a Jew in Nazi Germany in an internment camp. And he was wrestling through kind of like a Kaizen like philosophy in mm. uh, he ba basically like he was taken into this concentration camp and he was trying to find meaning or basically he took the opportunity. He's like, I I'm here. I'm a psychologist. I'm mm -hmm. going to do a psychological study essentially of the, the people that are here with me in this concentration camp. Yeah. And he began to analyze, you know, who are the people that survived and and did, you know, lived in mm -hmm. in this concentration camp and who didn't and he he had all these assumptions that it's going to be the people that were muscularly strong and the people that were you know brave and courageous and all these things and those weren't mm -hmm. the people that actually did well in the camp it was actually the people who found meaning in something intrinsic something deeper that couldn't be mm -hmm. stripped away because everything mm -hmm. was stripped away from people your muscles they ain't lasting your yeah. if, if you hold <laughs> if you hold your meaning and value and things that are tangible or complete like your home or your money or your job or any of those things, all those things can mm -hmm. be taken away from you. But for him, he was like, what are the things that I can hold on to that can never be taken from me yeah. no matter what? 
And then he comes up with this whole philosophy. And I, I mean, I could talk about this book for a long time, but logotherapy is basically his practice of, of finding meaning. Ah, and he talks yeah, about yeah. that at the end of the book. Anyway, mm -hmm. really fantastic nice. book. Emotional, but good one. Yeah, Recommend I'm definitely going to have to check it out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so back, back to the design, back to Tara a little bit here. I want to know, it, you know, journeying through the early phases, what were some of the challenges that you faced in design and, and associated particularly with Tara Kanama and the growth of the company? Uh, oh, man, primarily because it was, it was designed for, like, myself and for us. Um, it's often said, and I absolutely agree with it, that, uh, you are your own worst client <laughs> because uh, when you're designing for someone else, you can kind of see like not perfectly objectively, but you can kind of see through some of the assumptions that the client might be making or, you know, you can, you're a bit of like a, an outside third party. So you, you're less emotionally attached to the, uh, to the designs and you can kind of like work through the process. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're designing something for yourself, like perfectionism hits hard. It's, it's really tough to like, remove your own like emotional attachment to it and say like is this really good like is this actually what i'm is this is this actually saying what i wanted to say is it solving the problem that i wanted to or am i just holding on to it because i personally like it um so that was uh, and i still I, we still go through that all the time i still do that um so that's tough but uh it i'm getting slowly better at it i have like mechanisms for that as well so um yeah, it's uh, that was that's definitely the biggest challenge. And that's, that's been like the number one challenge over the years is just making sure that uh, I can find time to like step away from it and, and like really look at it again and say like, you know, do I just like this? Or is this actually, a, a, you know, achieving the goal that we're trying to achieve? So mm. yeah. Do you feel like you've gotten more confident over time? Yeah, a, a bit. Yeah. Um, imposter syndrome still kicks in every once in a while. And I think oh, yeah. we all experience that, but, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, it definitely, yeah. Just the, the more you do it, like kind of like creativity, I like kind of view it as like a bit of a wheel in motion. The more you do it, just the, the more it comes to you and that, that helps like knowing, you know, having just like a repertoire of like, you know, past designs that I can look at to, you know, give me some confidence and yeah, mm -hmm. move forward. At what point did you realize that, you know, your design, what, when were you most maybe proud of your designs in relation to Terraconomic? And then, and then also like outside of that, mm -hmm. I want to know kind of what you do outside of Terraconomic because you obviously went on to do a master's of architecture. Yes. And I don't think Terra is in the architecture business of building no. buildings. So I kind of want to know where the overlap <laughs> in the, in the, the Oh, there's actually is. quite a bit of, oh, okay. of overlap with that, but yeah. uh, probably most proud. Um, the first thing, I mean, there's probably a few of them, but the the one that like really jumped out at me was when, uh, I mean, Alex and I have been to Toy Fair several times with Konami USA, but um, the, the year- New York, we, New York Toy Fair? Yeah, the New York okay. Toy Fair. Um, it's the second biggest Toy Fair in the world, just after Nuremberg, I think. Um, Crazy. I, I might be wrong on that, but uh, yeah. Um, so we've been there several years with Konami USA, um, but the year that we actually had, it was with Konami USA still, but um, we had a tear pill booth at Toy Fair. Um, I think that was one of my, my proudest moments actually, because uh, we, you know, I designed the entire like booth layout and like Jeremy was amazing from Konami USA. He was amazing. He helped us like put us, put it together. And um, there was a group like halfway through the, the fair, there was a group of design students that came um, with their pro it was like some kind of field trip that they were taking on just to like, look at booth design and stuff. And, uh, and they all like, just loved our design, our booth, they like kept coming back to it and said it was like amazing. It was like, very like much like a humbling moment. It was like, Oh, mm. it was, like design students like my it was like, Oh, it's like a moment where it's like, I don't like, I feel like an imposter, like, but this is amazing. So it was, that was a very, very proud moment. Um, it was, for it was me. the classic student becomes teacher moment. Yeah, 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 definitely. For a moment, for, for a moment. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah that that's was, so cool. Yeah, that was a very cool moment for me. Now, you've done a bit of traveling for Kendama and gone around outside of the New York wow. Fair. Uh, <laughs> yeah. where, where have you all been for Kendama? Maybe it's a long list, but what, what are a it's few a places list. that you've been? Um, oh, man. Okay. So I mean, Alex and I travel, I mean, we've, we've been really lucky, very privileged that we've grown up with traveling families. So I've just been traveling a lot through like throughout my own life. Um, and uh, 
when we were, you know, like in the Kanama Edmonton days, we kind of just use like traveling as an excuse to to just go to Kendama events as well. Like we mm-hmm. kind of like couple them with traveling that we were already doing. So, I mean, we went to the original like Ken Garden battle, one of them, uh, Ken Garden battles in San Francisco, been to battle in Seattle, um, three of them, uh, been to, I've been to Japan. Oh, I don't even know how many times I've been to the, like the glow Ken cup. And I think the only um, Kendama world cup that I missed was, 2019 like yeah i think we've been to every other one you've been you've been to that many world cups yep. that's insane yep. yeah we've been to all of them yeah so except wait, for that's what five six uh glow Ken cup was 2013 and then 14 15 16 17 18 so five yeah I've been to five. holy yeah <laughs> that's a lot of times to go to japan yeah i know I've, that's I, awesome. I, yeah i've been six or seven times to japan i think now um yeah, so it, did it, you go to catch and flow as well or did you go outside no of that's Kenama? the one that's the one uh event that i haven't been to um i really wanted to go one year when um they were doing the all girls like Kendama event yeah. like the day before and it just it conflicted with school and i couldn't go but i mm. yeah i really wanted to go but yeah, we've been to uh, EJC as well. We went to um, EJC when it was in Poland one year. Um, yeah, a lot. So you've I'm been probably all over missing the world. some, but yeah, all, yeah, I've been all over the world. I've been incredibly lucky and privileged to travel all over the world. That's super <laughs> cool. Kendama, I, even yeah. Yeah, I remember. So uh, we were we were chatting about this before, but. For, the, for those that don't know, I mean, I'm kind of more re- just hashing this, but I had, you know, briefly encountered you or met you and I had recognized you. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was telling you about this. Uh, MKO 2018, I believe it was. Yes, we were yeah. in Mall of America. I was yeah. sitting there. I think you're even on my like MKO 2018 edit. I like did a vlog of the whole thing. And there's a scene or two in there that I think like mm-hmm. you're in the background next to Alex or whatever. And yeah. and. I had no idea who you were, but you were hanging out with all the people I thought were so cool. <laughs> and I was like, oh, these are all the legends. And like, I never talked to Alex once, but I definitely wanted to because he was like the Canadian, Kandami yeah. USA. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm Canadian. I need to chat with this guy. But Alex is big. Like, and he's, and he's got a like resting face too. That is like, he does, I'm, a li- yeah. I'm a little afraid of him. <laughs> well, I think also because, I mean, he doesn't normally have that, but when, like, when at he's MKO, judging. when he's judging, he just like, it's like the, the face comes <laughs> on and you know that he's just like in that mode now so. he's he's the king of judges for real like yeah. he is he is the most like i so i judged the year after that and i was like i have to live up to the canadian icon of judges which is alex <laughs> smith when i judge and so i was like i have to be right up close knees bending with everybody watching the finest of movements because alex is yeah. like the first and one I mean, to call a trick not good yeah and i mean he even i think he would be uh pretty quick to say that he even got that demeanor from other people like in judging like you know, in like the days of like the void, like at the BKA, like those, like those days when they had competitions and like um, Daniel Robinson, like I remember mm-hmm. him coming back from MKO one year. He's like, Daniel Robinson just like went straight into like hardcore judging mode. And I just <laughs> knew that it was, it was time. It, like I had to do it too. It like, so. We're going to step it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, so yeah. The, the point, the point being is like, I, I saw you there. I didn't know who you were, but I knew that you had to have been important in some capacity because oh, you, you. <laughs> you were surrounded by all of these other people that I had known and looked up to, but I didn't know you, but yet everybody there knew you, all of these really influential people. And I was like, okay, who is this person that is surrounded by all of these people I look up to, but I don't know who that person is. And I had seen you in vlogs numerous times on like the Kusa vlogs, or maybe it was on Sweets vlogs, you name it. And realizing that you had so much influence in this space of the Kanama community, yet you yourself may or may not actually be that big of a person in Kanama, but everybody knew you and respected you and and appreciated you for who you were. And I'm just curious, you know, like, what was that narrative like for you building up to these moments and playing what I mean, I mean, maybe you would say, or I, mm-hmm. I would say, like, kind of like a background role in the growth yeah. of Kanama through Terra or the Kanama USA. What was uh, that like? I mean, I honestly, I think it's just because I, I, I don't really seek out the spotlight. I'll be the first to admit it. I didn't even, I like had, I didn't have Instagram on my phone for like several years. I, you know, I've always kind of like played the background role a bit because I also, I, I just, I love design. I love being behind. The, the camera behind like 
you know, the work and kind of, I, I don't know, I feel like I just thrive at that quite well. Um, so I was just all, but I was always excited to be just a part of what was going on. And so, mm-hmm. you know, whenever Alex like was traveling, like we would travel together, I'd love to like be there and be a part of it. But I, I, I never really wanted to be like up front and center in the camera, like, you know, in a ton of like Arkanam Edmonton edits and even the Terra edits, like I usually have a trick or two, but you know, I never mm-hmm. really wanted to be like full on in the spotlight. I just wanted to be there to to help and like, you know, help see like, you know, my vision, our vision, like, you know, the mm-hmm. Tara's vision, Kanami Osei's vision, like come to life. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed being a part of that and, and just pretty much down to like take any opportunity I could to like come along and, and work on stuff. And um, yeah, I remember like I, when, one year when Alex was going to Konami Yosei, like to New York for the toy fair for Konami Yosei, I just, I, we were living in separate cities at the time. So I said, hey, like, mm-hmm. I I would love to come out and just, you know, hang out and see you and, you know, see Kandami, like see you, but like hang out in New York. And um, and I ended up ha- like just hanging out and helping out and working in the, t- in the Konami Yosei booth the entire weekend. And I remember the owner, Jeremy, was like shocked. He was like, you're in New York and you don't want to just like go wander around New York. You want to actually like sit in this booth with us all day. I was like, yeah, cause this is like where it's happening. I want to, I want to be a part of it. Um, and I think just that willingness to like be around and, and help out and, and just see this vision like carry forward um, really helped me in a lot of ways. And the other thing is that, um, I mean, when we first started playing Kendama, like, yeah, it was, it was all on the internet. It was like just us making YouTube videos and like, seeing you know maybe the 11 other people on youtube also making you know kendama edits um but really where like where the magic really was was when we actually got to see each other in person like Mm -hmm. on these trips and i think that was like a huge role in um in kind of cementing these relationships and finding this network of people was actually being able to travel and and you know being able to see these people in person so for me for the longest time, kind of still to this day, even with the pandemic, like Kinama still is very much like an in-person thing for me. And I, I realize that that's not, that's not like the reality for a lot of people, especially in this world, like, you know, in this year and, and whatnot. But uh, for me, like Kinama has always been like being in those rooms, like at those competitions, seeing people. So even if I wasn't that active on social media or the internet and mm-hmm. Instagram, all that, um, where I was really active was just you know, being in person and interacting with people. So, um, yeah, I might, I might be in the background of a lot of like internet, um, moments, but I was, I was around for a lot of like the in-person stuff that's really important. So I cherish those for sure. Yeah. And I think that's the piece that people miss sometimes. It's like you, you don't have to be front and center to Mm -hmm. be an impact or be an influence in those spaces. And even going back to like our, our our little conversation on design that I definitely want to jump back to in a bit, but Mm -hmm. you know, the, the subtleties of the things that happen in the background, the people that are doing those changes, you know, updating the user experience, uh, updating the design of something, the people that you don't ever see front and center, Mm -hmm. they're the backbone of what's actually making it. And and they're the people that are holding (laughs) things down, bringing it together, you know, whether or not that is from a design or that person who's your local guy at the jam, who just hypes everybody up. He may not land the biggest tricks. He may not do anything, but he empowers everybody else or she empowers everybody else to be better. And Mm -hmm. those are the people that I think are so valuable in Kendama that go so unrecognized in in their roles and what they do because Mm -hmm. they play such an important role to the grander community around them. And I think sometimes we forget about them and forget the roles that they played. Yeah. Uh, Personal question. Um, Mm -hmm. You can can choose not to answer if you'd like. You know, in, in the early stages of Kendama, uh, Alex was introduced first, correct? Yeah, yeah. Or sure. around, around the same time. I'm, I'm <laughs> curious, was Kendama like a you and Alex thing together or was it an Alex thing then you came? And, and what was that dynamic like for, for you mm-hmm. guys? I think I've only ever really had one other uh, qu- couple on, on uh, the review. We, you know, we talked yeah. to uh, Steve, Steezy Wonder a while back. Mm-hmm. We were chatting about like a Dama relationship and what that looked like. And I was just curious, like, has, was Kanama always like a thing that you did together? Or do you think that Kanama is your thing and Alex's thing separately? Or, you, you know, I'm just the dynamics yeah, of it. You know, yeah. what does that been like for you? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, when he first, he found it first, he was like, you know, um, a friend like introduced him to it and mm -hmm. he showed it to me and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And at first, at, at first I wasn't like immediately like hooked or anything. Like Alex had one and I would just, I would play with his every once in a while and he'd be like, oh, I got to get you your own. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I can just use yours. <laughs> it's fine. I can just use yours. And uh, so that kind of like went that way for, I don't know, a few months. And then I think it was for my birthday that he got me a Red Azora. And that was like my first Kendama. And, uh, and I don't even think it was when I first spiked it that it was like when I was hooked. It was when I got my first bird. And I was like, oh, yeah. it's on now. Um, and so, yeah, I, w I would definitely say that uh, throughout the years, um, it's definitely something that we do together. I mean, like we run a company together, we've traveled mm -hmm. together. Um, you know, Alex has like his own entire role with Konami OSA and like as a pro and like, that's his role. That's his, you know, that's his life with Konami. And like, you know, I don't need to be like a part of that, but um, I would definitely say that we, it's something that we've done together for a long time. And um, I've always just loved, like I've loved playing Konami, but I also just loved like, being there to like film tricks for him and mm. being there to like you know if he's like working on a trick and he's like oh just either frustrated or not exactly sure how to like end it or something you know it's like you know i'd be there to like consult him on that and like he's still to this day when he's hand turning kendamas sometimes he'll get to like a critical juncture and he'll come to me and be like oh i don't know if like it's like the cerdo should be turned this way or this way what do you think and like i, I feel like for a for a lot of like our our kendama careers um it's it's been a lot of like you know us just like consulting with each other and and you know me being there for like support and and just the background like role and and I don't you know some people don't like that but I don't mind having that role because it allows mm. me to work on like the things that I I find to be a priority which is just like the vision of like creating space and like mm. and you know helping Kendama move forward so yeah, yeah that's so that's beautiful that's pretty, <laughs> that's so beautiful i love that that gets me excited mm -hmm. i think it's humbling too right because i think so many yeah. of us i know for me that would be a challenge like i i i have way too much ego in my life to like <laughs> be like oh let me just take a back seat and, and i try to like i try to call that for sure but i i know that for so many people it's hard to like take that and say like okay no actually i i want to play more in the background and elevate other people up and be there to support others. And mm -hmm. it, like, just to acknowledge that, that is a huge respect that, that you do I, that. I mean, That's I'm, incredible. I'm not, it's, no, it's not like I've always been perfect either. I've definitely had no, moments where, you know, I want, I was like hoping to have like a little bit more of like a recognition here or a recognition mm -hmm. there, or like, you know, I wish someone like had used my trick here or something, you know, like there's, it's not, mm -hmm. it's definitely not perfect. And, you know, you don't need to be perfect. I've had my own stumbles with that, but um, I've also found that like when I, you know, when I, it, there are a lot of times like being thrust into the spotlight where I really didn't like it. Like when I, you know, when I finally got that moment of like, Oh, I was like, you know, in the spotlight, like I, you know, I, I just, I wanted to be more in the background as well. I wanted to like work behind the scenes and mm -hmm. like, you know, I, cause I'm not, I'm, I don't know. I, I flip flop between being an extrovert and an introvert a lot, but uh, <laughs> I definitely tend towards more being an introvert. So, you know, it's some like, yeah. Well, I found that the, the spaces where I really thrived were spaces where I could just like, you know, think about what I be methodical, think about what I wanted to do next and like help move the scene forward for sure. Like, yeah. Yeah, and, and honestly, you've probably done more for Kendama in, in the role that you've been in, in the background, and doing the unseen work that's empowered oh, so you. much of the work that's been done in, in Kendama, than had you just taken the opportunity to be mm -hmm. like, oh, let me just get as many likes on my Instagram posts, and like, let's, let's build yeah. up my followers, let's make sure that I, I get seen by everybody. Like, that, that can be such a waste of time when there are so many beautiful projects to be working mm -hmm. on that actually are impactful and empowering, and just so powerful. And, yeah. and and I think yeah. you've prioritized that so well. And now we've seen mm -hmm. some of the fruits of that labor. It's like, okay, would Tara Kanama be where it is if you were focused on chasing after all that stuff? <laughs> Probably not. Would would the all girls Kanama open be where it's at if yeah. you were doing all that? Probably not. That's a good not. example, actually. Yeah, yeah, because that one actually was that sort. I mean, I'm sure 
I like you can ask Haley about this as well. She might have a slightly different answer. But I remember that one of the biggest impetuses for like starting the all girls Kanama contest and all that was actually the Crom girls contest. They had like a girls only like video contest that Haley and I both like entered. I um, can't remember if Steph entered it. But uh, yeah, so we so we entered it and Haley and I thought we were like, oh, yeah, okay. So it's going to be one of the two of us that wins. And then Yumi came out of nowhere and just swept us both. <laughs> it was, like, gnarly. It was crazy. Um, but uh, as soon as, like, we we entered that contest and, and that was kind of over and the dust settled, um, I remember Haley and, and I and, and several others, like, talking, like, man, we should just do this ourselves. Like, this should be, like, this should be girl run. Like, we should do this. So um, really, like, you know, we, we started like, you know, uh, working on a video contest and then that really like scaled into like Haley and Yuka working on like in-person contests and taking that on. And, Mm -hmm. um, and through that, like, you know, a lot of us sort of, you know, faded a bit into, into the background of the people who are like running these contests instead of, you know, being in them. And, um, and I really, really enjoy that because it's allowed me at least to see just so many more, uh, so many more women um, in the community allowed to like give them the space to like, you know, be in the, in the spotlight, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's giving, that's given me so much more joy and empowerment than, you know, my little like 30 second video that I had like on the Crom girls, like contest. Like, Mm -hmm. so yeah, I've I've found that like creating space for other people around me is like a lot more um, like rewarding, I think for me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's super cool. Uh, we'll take a moment here in a couple seconds to mm-hmm. to jump into some questions from the chat and some from the Patreon yeah. and people that have submitted ahead. But I want to know, okay, uh, give give us a brief summary of what your role is at Terra Kanama now, just to kind of like capstone a bit of what you've been doing at Terra. Um, uh, and we'll probably fill mm-hmm. in some gaps throughout. But you know, if if I if you were to tell someone what your job is at Terra, what is it? <laughs> uh, people ask me this all the time. Like, what is your job description? I I don't know if I have one. It's kind of everything. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I do, I do kind of like product design. Um, I help Alex with like, you know, shape design stuff. I do like one of the things you were asking about, like architecture, how does it translate over? I yeah. do all the CAD work for like our, uh, when we're creating like new designs or new shapes or anything like that. Um, I, I actually like create like 3D files for it, which I never would have been able to do like had I not had, you know, learn that in in some fashion um so i I work on that but i also do just kind of like i uh, another one is website design i kind Mm -hmm. of maintain like our website uh photography all the product photos um not all but a ton of like you know just the actual like life like pro photos the Mm -hmm. like action photos that kind of stuff um and then also just the day-to-day like i make sure that like our employees get paid and are happy and you know can eat and go home and all that um yeah, do our, some of our bookkeeping, just kind of like keeping Tara running, you know, um, on the day to day. A lot of it is like a ton of overlap with what Alex does. But, yeah. you know, because we didn't really like fall into really clearly defined like roles. And yeah. it's just kind of like, you know, when there was a gap that we that that needed filling, like one of us would just fill it. So yeah. we, a lot of our roles like intertwined quite a bit. So. Yeah, was that interesting? Okay, at what point did you realize that you and Alex were going into business together? Like you guys had both, it really started out as a club. And then all yeah. of a sudden one day you're like, hey, look, I, I guess we're, uh, we're kind of doing this thing. Yeah, I don't know if there was really like a hard set line because it really just like slowly grew. Like, you know, we didn't, we didn't really plan that it was going to be a business. I mean, I wasn't even technically a founder of Terra. It was Alex and Ben. Um, yeah. And, you know, we for the first few years, we were just doing this as like a summer job because we were both yeah. in school. And so it was just kind of it was too cold to turn Dama's in winter. Oh, I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, remember, I remember Alex saying that because yeah. you, you guys were doing it in the garage and, and he's yeah. like, I ain't yeah. doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so it was really just kind of part time. And then, you know, Alex finished school and was folk at, at that time was focusing quite a bit on like Nami Ose because he was, um, you know, like that was that was like really taking off for him being a pro there. And I was still in school. So it was like still part time um and it really only just kind of like morphed into i think it was really when i finished or i was about to finish like architecture school 
where it was really coming down to like, okay, like, you know, everyone around me is like, okay, so you're going to start working for a firm. Like, what are you going to do? And I was like, mm, honestly, I've been kind of like splitting half of my time with Tara for a long time. I need to like give this, like, you know, I need to give this at least like a year of like my full attention with nothing mm. else around. And I think maybe that was when like, it finally kind of clicked. They were like, yeah, okay. Now we're not only like Alex and I are not only together, we're like running a business together. Mm -hmm. So, but um, it kind of slipped in very naturally and five years later, almost still doing it. So yeah, yeah that that's crazy. So mm -hmm. do, did you, are you working elsewhere or are you full-time Tara? Full-time Tara, but I've also done, I mean, it's still Kendama work, but I've also done um, design work for like Kendama USA. Like I've done design work for other companies and stuff. So um, mm -hmm. it's all, I'm full-time Kendama design, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's cool. Did you yeah. end up doing any architecture work like with an agency after you finished your master's in architecture? Uh, I haven't done an internship in order to get licensed, at least in Canada, you have to do okay. a, an internship afterwards and then pass like a licensing exam. So I haven't done that, but I did, you know, while I was in school, I worked with a ton of just architects, like otherwise, um, mm -hmm. mostly in like my, I mean, my thesis was in like, like garment making and like the idea of like the connection between like clothing and like a, your body and like built space around you. So it was a lot interesting. Of, it was much smaller scale than you know what I think a lot of people traditionally think of like architecture. They think of like buildings. And I, I think of the new buildings in Calgary. Have you yeah, have you seen yeah. the Have you been inside the new Calgary Library? No, I haven't. It's insane. I haven't seen it. You yeah. have to come and and, and yeah. take a walk through. I think it Snow is. Heda maybe did that one. I'm not totally sure, but yeah. I'm not sure, but I know that uh, yeah. Christian Fraser when he was on here, he was geeking oh, yeah, out yeah. about it because he's like, nice. yeah, I know that I know the people that made that. He was hyped on it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, no, I've talked to Christian Fraser a bunch about stuff. He works at Perkins Will, I think, um, okay. which has like a, a presence like in Vancouver. Um, and uh, yeah, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, you know, my, my thesis was like very small scale. So a lot of the architects that I worked on were doing like, you know, sewing projects or they were creating mm -hmm. like, you know, small pavilions and pop up like um, exhibits <laughs> and stuff. So uh, yeah, I have I have like worked and like collabed with a ton of like my profs and and architects in the in the business. Um, yeah. But I no, I haven't I haven't gotten licensed or done an internship at all yet. Is that so, something that you want to do? I'm I haven't closed the door on it yet. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I am also I also feel pre pretty fulfilled like just like using my skills in kendama because a lot of it does translate over like i said yeah. i get to do like actual like product design and like use like those same sort of like skills that i that i use in architecture mm -hmm. but just on a smaller scale on a on a different scale um but that that being said like i could still see myself being in the architecture world like at some point um i'm just kind of you know seeing seeing where like life takes me in my design right now so the, I mean, it's pretty rad to say that you guys are probably the only economic company aside from maybe Sweets, if they consider Christian an employed, uh, you know, player mm -hmm. uh, that has a master's of architecture on their team, yeah. helping them to design <laughs> their economics, which is absolutely nuts. Like, that's so cool. Thank you. I think yeah. that's awesome. Cool. Well, hey, let's take a quick moment here and mm -hmm. let's uh, dive into some questions here. We got uh, one or two from the patrons and then we'll dive into some of the other questions uh, from mm -hmm. Kendama Cares. Uh, this is... Yeah everybody's favorite mama in the community mm -hmm. asking or saying, first yeah. off, she says this, Kristen yeah. has been such an integral part of laying the foundation for female Kanama players. Uh, she would love to know if there is a milestone that we, the collect of the royal we, oh. have realized that has surprised you and one that we haven't, but thought that we would have by 2021. So I think kind of to, to summarize, you know, is yeah, there a milestone yeah. in Kanama that we've hit or one that mm -hmm. you thought we were going to hit, but we haven't hit yet? Um, hmm. I don't know about like specific like miles, like, you know, if something's like, when I think of milestone, I think of like a marker of like, we've hit like X number of something or whatever. But um, honestly, I'm, I'm really inspired, uh, especially since I have, I literally just re-downloaded Instagram on my phone, like maybe a few weeks ago. Uh, so I haven't been that active and like, the, you know, online community. But when I 
down, you know, when I downloaded and kind of like reemerged, I was really inspired to just how many women are in and, you know, non-binary, non-men like are Mm -hmm. in the Kendama community, Um, especially people that I I didn't know. Like, you know, I think Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, that sounds like, like hubris, but uh, for a long time, I knew almost every single Mm -hmm. woman in the Kendama community because there weren't that many of us, (laughs) you know? So I, I think that's really inspiring to me to see like, that it's not just like, oh, the women that like, oh, I know, like, I know her, You're like, oh, I know her, I know them, like, yeah, so like, I, I think seeing like women that I don't know that are, you know, that are just inspiring to me, um, that are in the game and creating their own communities, their own little hubs everywhere. That's a, that's mm-hmm. a huge milestone for me personally. Um, milestone that we haven't hit yet. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think like, this is this is a bit of a strange one. I remember for a long time, Haley and I like kind of had differing views on on the role of um, like women's categories in competitions mm-hmm. because I personally at the time didn't really see it as as helpful to like you know segregate and separate separate um, mm-hmm. women from men because I personally don't see there actually being any physical advantage between the the two um, when it comes to kendama. Um, but Haley saw that very differently because she saw it as a space to empower and, and welcome women um, and encourage them to compete. And that's t- she's totally changed my mind on that. I totally see now mm. that like how helpful those spaces are. But I guess like I would love to see. Uh, I'd love us to reach a milestone where it's not a given that uh, like a man's going to win a competition. And I mean, mm. I think we're almost there. Like we're already there in like Japanese, in the Japanese world, like definitely there, mm-hmm. but I'd love to see in North America where like, it's not a given that it's going to be like a man standing yeah. in first place winning the cash prize. So oh, uh, yeah. I guess uh, if there's a milestone that we could reach, I would love to see it where, you know, it could, it could be anyone. Um, oh Yeah. Yeah. There, there are some incredible women in the community that have popped up in the last year or two years mm-hmm. in terms of Kenoma play that are just taking it by storm. I am yeah. so excited to see the development and the growth. Uh, are there any women in particular uh, that you see as like, oh. wow, this person's incredible. I think that they are going to make a big impact in the competitive Kenoma space. Oh, man. Um I mean, honestly, I, I, I'm not like, again, like I, I haven't been super connected with the online world and, you know, mm-hmm. in-person events have really taken a hit the last year, obviously. So um, honestly, I think, again, like just all the Japanese players that we watch every year on like the, um, you know, all girls kendama contest and stuff like seeing them grow up and like get just incredibly good like i remember um like noah and um i think her name's ito koyama like she's she's one who has like all these years have had like a little pig like stuffed animal that she like plays with in her uh in her edits um i remember they were putting edits out when they were like five years old like for the all girls kanama contest and now they're still putting out edits for that contest like five years on and they're just incredible like like i just to see that kind of development is like huge for me so i think that's though like yeah the japanese like kendama players are taking like the world by storm i think for sure so yeah is there anyone that you're following in north america uh that, north america that you've seen? um not particularly because like i said i've just i just you know, like have been entering Instagram again, really, like right. in the last like few weeks. And so honestly, I've just been like, like realizing how few of them I, I follow because, you know, I they, they mm. either went around or I wasn't aware of them. So I've just been like, follow, 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 like starting to like, yeah. just, like get my bearings again and like seeing so many, so many new uh, players is, is really inspiring. So yeah, no, yeah. I, I, you'll have to check back with me on that one. I gotta just like, <laughs> we'll do a, we'll do a recap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so many though. Yeah. Okay. My per- personal question, then we'll jump into a couple. We got some from Skaggs and uh, mm-hmm. we got a really important question that we need to hash out from Kanama Max Angel, a uh, new Terra employee. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll hit that one here. I know what this one is already. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, out of curiosity, you took time off of Instagram and you weren't really in the social yeah. space. Did you actually find that to be beneficial for your design? Because I think I, I have seen this 
over and over and over again that actually the the some of the best designers are the ones that are not connected to like the <laughs> ecosystems that they're participating in and the reason yeah. being is they don't allow all of the opinions and influences of all these people saying all of these things to impact their creative judgment uh, mm -hmm. on something and so when they're removed from something they're able to just create organically from their own like inspiration uh, did you mm -hmm. find that for you uh, yeah, I mean, like, honestly, I also just found like taking like a several year break from like social media was just good for my own mental health is yeah. good for a lot of things. So um, and also just, you know, like not not having the the pressure to like feel like you're keeping up like that. That was a, a big one for me as well. So yeah. I will say yes, it definitely changed my relationship with just like you know the internet and social media and that kind of connectedness for a long time I was following like you know I was just following like my friends and other Kanama people and, and stuff and uh, uh I, after I took a break and kind of started coming back I just started following like other accounts like just random like design accounts architecture accounts illustration mm -hmm. accounts and like see just having like a bit of like more of an anonymous relationship with like the content that I viewed um, on the internet really like helped like just open up my uh, open up like my mind to like other influences mm -hmm. other like you know design aspects and and like really like that was freeing for me as well so I think I think it did have a positive totally. impact on my design but not necessarily because I was just like completely cut off it's just I changed my relationship with the content that I viewed. Um, and I think that's mm -hmm. really beneficial. I think people really need to like, to take that, like take, take in like Instagram and social media in like doses and like understand mm -hmm. the, re the relationship that they have with that, that content and, and those spaces for sure. I think I see this a lot in players in their creativity of play. I think some of the most creative players are the ones that are the most disconnected from, from Instagram and from social media. Because if, if you are playing Kendama for clout or for social engagements mm -hmm. or any of these things, you're only ever going to produce something that people want to see, which is usually the thing that everybody else is doing because, and you're just trying to do it better. Whereas you yeah. look at a guy like Ben Harold and Ben Harold takes like a year to mm -hmm. go and just like live in a forest. I don't know what he does, <laughs> but he literally comes back and then is so inspired with this new creative play style. And it yeah. seems so uninfluenced by the Kanama world that mm -hmm. he's just organically created something that's unique. And, and he is maybe, maybe, maybe I'm totally off base, but I assume that he's probably l less connected to the social Instagram world as a lot of the other influence, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of the other players are. I think if more people would just take the time to like, just take a step away, they're going to come back with all sorts of new ways of playing Kanama or new yeah. ways of just approaching life in general, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just like trying to put out content that other people are already putting out. It's like, Definitely. Dang. Yeah. That's my thoughts. Yeah. Okay. We got lots of other questions. I can ask a hundred mm -hmm. uh, of my own, but we want, we want to, <laughs> we want to hear what the people want to hear. Uh, Brian Skegline wants to know, what is your biggest pet peeve about living with Alex? And what is your favorite thing about living with Alex? Give us oh, the beef man. on on Alex. Yeah, Smith. I know he's gonna. <laughs> he's literally in the background. He's gonna laugh at this. Um, well, I know Skagline wants me to say Alex time, but uh, that's not what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Smith Smith time. Yeah. Yeah, Smith time. The um, legend, no, legendary clock. Yeah. Um, no, probably what I would say is my pet peeve is uh, Alex can be a bit of like a squirreler. He can like he just like tends to like tuck stuff away into corners and nooks and crannies like. Uh, yeah, I don't know, just like stuff that he wants to keep or any, I don't know. And I'm like definitely a person who just wants to pull all the stuff out of the corners because it's like, it just looks cleaner. It's easier to clean. I like to like having like a nice like setup and, and living situation. So that we constantly battle. It's like I, I'll pull stuff out and then he'll put it back and I'll pull <laughs> it out again and he'll put it back. And yeah, so that's, that's it. But um, my favorite thing about living with Alex is uh, he is, an incredible improviser at cooking. He, I, I tend to like cook by recipes. And if we don't have exactly all the items that we need, then I'm just like kind of lost. I'm like mm. deer in the headlights a bit, but he can just like look in the fridge at the most like unbelievable, like array of different objects and create amazing meals. And he always keeps me incredibly well fed. So, mm. yeah, so, so he's a great person who's the to, better cook? to live with in that. If, if you had all the ingredients in the world, Oh, at your fingertips i don't know is a battle, battle we're just of very the cooks. we're very different i guess i okay. i don't know we're just very different at our style like he he just like 
tosses things together and creates amazing like things and i definitely go more by recipe and like established like order yeah. um yeah i don't know i don't think i could really say like if i think we're we're both like pretty good but like just very different style v vancouver's got a good food culture too there's so many organic like markets and stuff there yeah. you can so like eat sushi. very sustainable yeah oh. so much like cheap delicious sustainable sushi like really good sushi vancouver yeah. just got a good food scene in general their mm -hmm. craft beer market their organic foods the fruits you name it everything it's like yeah it's a really good place to go and eat yeah i haven't yeah. been to vancouver but i've been to like the other like lower mainland i've been to chillwack right. abbotsford it's yeah, yeah. fairly close you know but the coffee mm -hmm. as well yeah. I, need, I need to come to vancouver my hope is if the border restrictions between alberta yeah. and bc lift I'm booking a flight. I'm coming out this summer. I'm going to come yeah, hang out with it. the terror squad. So that's, yeah. that's the plan. We'd love uh, to have you. Awesome. Uh, Kazoku or mm -hmm. Kaz Oku oh, yeah. underscore Kendama. I can never remember how to like pronounce it, but Nate, uh, he says, Kristen, when you are struggling with design and artwork, what do you oh, do to promote yeah. and inspire creativity? How do you get out of a rut? Oh man. Yeah. That one, that's an infamous question. I saw that one and instantly was like, yeah, every designer gets asked that question. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I give it, I gave it some thought and, and part of it is like I said, kind of earlier, it's that I, I kind of view like creativity uh, a bit like a wheel in motion, just like the more you do it, the, the easier it gets. Like, um, so part of it is just being a bit proactive. So like, you know, a lot of what I do is I just, I, I take pictures of everything that I see that is like really interesting to me or just inspires me in some way. And I might not exactly know like what it inspires me, like why it does or like what it's useful for, but just kind of creating like a catalog of, of just stuff that I'm interested in. Um, mm -hmm. Doesn't really matter what field it's in or whatnot. Um, I also keep a notebook, like I write and scribble and just like all kinds of stuff in this notebook all the time. Um, and then, uh, you know, when I'm kind of struggling or I'm in a bit of a rut, uh, before I do like anything, before I walk away, I, I just, I have to like get down like the really like bare bones fundamentals of like, what am I trying to solve here? Because design is ultimately about mm -hmm. like, you know, a solving a problem or like creating the utility of some kind. Um, so it's like, I just, I just get that out onto the page. It's like, what is like the bare bones of what I'm trying to do here, the bare fundamentals um, and then I, I go for walks. I, I get, a, I move, I go away. Like, you know, I, I leave the problem for a while mm -hmm. and I let it just kind of like percolate in the back of my mind for a bit. Um, sometimes I just, honestly, every designer seems to say this, but just taking a shower or something, just like, I don't know, there's mm -hmm. something about like just getting out of that mental space and like turning off for a second, like water you're not bringing your phone you. in there or anything. Yeah. You're just sitting there with your own thoughts that yeah. uh, seriously yeah. shower That's thoughts really is a real helps. thing it is a very real thing. So very yeah, real. So that's, that's a big one. It's just like kind of proactively like fostering like a, a space or a catalog of like ideas that, that you want to work on that, or that you're thinking on and whatnot. And then when you are struggling, like really like having that to come back to, like really laying down, like what is it that you're trying to like achieve and then giving you, yourself the space to just like go away and like not, like consciously think about it for a little while. That's, that's what helps me at least. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. For me, yeah. I, I have such a barrier in my own head with creativity and I think it's cause I like consume so much that I never mm -hmm. actually take the time Tough. to sit still and yeah. I'm always moving. I'm always trying to work on the next thing. And I, and I stifle my creativity so, so, so much, but some of the mm -hmm. moments in my life when I've like, found the most creativity was back when I was in college and I was I had this like line of trees where I, I used to be a max and dirt jump and stuff and I just would go out there for hours at a time with a shovel and just dig dirt and build dirt jumps and ride my bike and out there yeah. I didn't really touch my phone I was just by myself and that was where I had some of the greatest thoughts or like the most profound realizations or the deepest thinking mm -hmm. the most creative concepts that would have ever came to me were in those moments where I just stepped out and I went away yeah. for a bit. And I yeah. think that's one of the best things people can do for creativity. And again, like, mm -hmm. I think you, you did that a little bit with uh, you leaving Instagram and like Ben mm -hmm. Harold, you name it. I think, I think it's a practice in general. People should take, take an hour a day or a couple yeah. hours a week and just go mm -hmm. sit somewhere in a forest, do something different. Yeah, I don't know. definitely. No, I, I, it's really important for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely.
Uh, okay, the, here's the real question though from Max Angel, mm -hmm. Kanama Max Angel. He wants to know, uh, I'm asking on his behalf. Let yeah. me, uh, before I preface, great employee, great customer service. He's been doing some really great work on the Instagram. <laughs> this is my boy. Uh, he's been doing a good job. I'm serious. Uh, mm -hmm. He just wants to know really politely, can he have Tuesday off? Depends on how good he golfs today. We're, we're doing some pitch and putt players club today afterwards. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll take it into consideration depending on uh, how well he plays today. <laughs> you hear that, Max? If you're tuning in, you got to bring out your egg game. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Colin Hislop, H. Slop wants to know what your favorite aesthetically kendama, uh, what is your favorite kendama that you have had a part in designing uh, in the design process, aesthetically speaking? <laughs> Sorry, I just saw Max. <laughs> yeah, Max is bro. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So um, favorite Kanama that I've had a part in designing. Um, I, give, I did see this one like uh, yesterday or whenever he posted and I was giving it some thought. Um, honestly, the one that it, like comes to mind, pro partly because of the design process that, that we went under um, to do it was... Uh, the Nobu mod, the Konami uh, Osei Nobu mod, Pro mod. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Do you, so wait, 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 hold on. Before you answer that, do you play a big yeah. role in the design of Konami USA Konamas as uh, well as Terra? So, some of it, some of it. Yeah, for sure. I do some like design work for uh, Konami USA. So he's come, like Jeremy has come to me with some some projects before. Yeah. Um, and the Nobu mod was, um, that the reason that one comes to like mind is because uh it was super restrictive, like design constraints, like pretty much all we got from Nobu, uh, again, part, probably partly because of like language barriers as well, was mm -hmm. he just sent like a photo of like a match soda bottle and was like, I want that. And went, okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. I've never designed anything based off of like a, a soda bottle before basically. Um, so I think that one was like very interesting to like really work our heads around like, okay, like how do we, how do we evoke this idea without like just literally putting like a match soda bottle on this like kendama? So I think that one was really, I really enjoyed doing that one. Cause that one really like worked my brain a lot of like, how do I, how do I create a, a, an object out of this with like almost no input? <laughs> so yeah. yeah, that one was a fun one. And then uh, probably like a Terra one was um, probably the Van Jam Dama. I really enjoy that one. Cause that one's kind of like, a pun that just like went down the rabbit hole a bit <laughs> so uh where it's you know like the name like van jam to jam and we've like used like that idea of like having mm -hmm. like jam jars and stickers for a long time um like blackberry bushes and raspberry bushes are kind of like endemic to the vancouver area so mm -hmm. it just kind of like you know it's an idea that just snowballed further and further and further and i i really like how those ones turned out so yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I was I was thinking it was this one, but this is the Dom on the drive one, not the not yeah. the Van Jam. I need to come yeah. out to Van Jam. I've been dying to come. I'm mm -hmm. I'm like a Canadian and I haven't even been to it yeah. yet. What am I doing with my <laughs> life? <laughs> yeah. But uh, that that's so cool. So do you design pretty much the majority of, of all of the Kanamas that Terra produces in terms of the design of them? Is yeah, that you? Yeah. Yep, that's that's me. Um, I mean, depending on you know like what model it is, like we'll we'll get input from like the pro team. We mm -hmm. we always kind of put stuff out for just like their input. If they ever have ideas that they want to like come to us like with, it, like we're always down to like you know take them. Like if they want to actually do the design themselves, like I'm I'm very on board for that kind of stuff. But I'm always there to you know help them out if if. Like, you know, if someone doesn't exactly know how to design it or they are, they have an idea, but they're not exactly sure. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we, we work on that with them. Um, a lot of it is like Alex and, and Max now, and I like collabing just like on ideas, like brainstorming mm -hmm. at the table. Um, yeah. But uh majority of like, whether it's just like the, the like technical, like file prep work or the actual like creative um, side of it as well. Yeah. Most of it's me. That's super cool. Uh, yeah. So what, what does that process look like with you and a pro? Because I, I know uh, a lot of people that listen to this podcast want to become sponsored, want to get their own pro mod at some <laughs> point in their life. And one of the things that I think so many people dream of and think of as players is like, I want to design my own pro model. 
Uh, <laughs> and, you know, they might have some elaborate idea or scheme of, of what that looks like. And obviously you've worked with a handful of pros in mm -hmm. helping them design their, their pro models. Talk yep. me through that process a little bit from the designer side, because obviously the pro has their own perspective of like, oh, I want it to mean this and this and this. And, and how does that process yeah. look for you as a designer? Um, a lot of the time, a, it, a bit of it is just like teasing out like what's the really bare bones fundamental like concept that they want. Because um, sometimes, you know, like what you get is like surface level, like information where like, like, I really want it to be like orange. And you're like, okay, cool. But like, is there anything past that? You know, that, you know, like, what what is behind that? Or like, I really want it to have like, this image, like stamped on the big cup. And, like, you know, they just tell me what the image is. But I, you know, I want to know a little bit of like the motivations behind why they want that. Is it significant to them? Is it like behind like a larger concept of like, you know, um, that they're, they're thinking about, but they're not necessarily telling me. Um, it's like almost like it, a psychological dig into their head a little bit. You yeah, get a little bit. It. Yeah. Like Misu's like promo. Like, sorry, one second. Alex is. Let me take your clothes. Yes, please. Okay. All right. See you, see you a little bit. They're they're leaving for pitch and putt, and I'm going to join them later. So yeah. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we won't try and keep you too much. Oh no, it's then. all good. It's all good. It's all good. Um, but uh, what so, is like, pitch and putt? First off, pitch and putt is what like does that even short, mean? Short golf. <laughs> is that like mini golf or? Uh, no, it's bigger than mini golf, but it's like it's it's like the idea that you pretty much the reason it's like pitch and putt is the idea that it's like the golf course is short enough that you really only need like a pitching wedge and a uh, putter. So okay, it's so like. Yeah, but it's, smaller than a par three. It's a it's a par three basically. It's like you okay. know, or it's like a it depends like where you are, but like there are par three courses that are are quite long. But pitch and putts are usually like they're usually in cities. Like in Edmonton, there's a few pitch and putts like around the 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 River Valley, Vancouver. Okay. They've got one in Stanley Park. Like they're it's short golf basically. Okay, okay. I was yeah. like, I have no idea what they're talking about. I was like, <laughs> I, I just need to know. Okay, so okay. Yeah. yeah sorry. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I was gonna say like with um like Misu's pro model, like she was very you know like with the the Natura pro mods, like we ki we kind of came up with the idea. We're like, okay, for like you know this round of like pro mods, um like it can be a bit like like overwhelming to just like come up with an entire concept for like your your own pro model by yourself like that when the options are like seemingly endless mm -hmm. so we decided to give them the design constraint of like okay um we just want you to pick like your favorite landscape whether that's whether that's like a mountain landscape or like an airport you know like whatever it is like pick your favorite like landscape and we mm -hmm. can take colors and and ideas from that um, and that gave them a bit of a constraint to just like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. find something that they wanted from there. Misu came back and just told me like, oh, I, I love this park that's near my house. Like, and we had been there. We've actually been there to film Kendama with her um, before. And she said like, you know, just, just design something based on that park. So she just gave me a landscape, which was kind of, you know, the base foundation of what like she wanted. And I created all the illustrations out of that. Mm -hmm. um, someone like, june or rice um they had they came up with the design like almost entirely themselves and then like just actually helped me like I needed my help with like the technical like drawing of like the illustrations and stuff so right. sometimes it, you know every pro is different um like like i said with like nobu is pretty much like mm -hmm. i just want this match bottle and like we had to like suss out whether it was like it is that really all you want or is there something behind the match bottle that like you want? Is it the colors? Mm -hmm. Is it bubbly? Is like, what is it kind of thing? Um, so a lot of the time my process is just kind of like so sorting out like what is like the bare bones, like message that we need to get across and then building on top of that. Yeah, that that's super fascinating. I know for me, like I'm not a designer. So <laughs> even one of the, okay, so I've been, I've been teasing out whether or not I want to get a tattoo uh, mm -hmm. this year. I don't, I don't have any tattoos, but I think they're cool <laughs> and I kind of want one. Yeah. Uh, but my biggest barrier is I have all of these abstract concepts in my mind that are like just concepts that I want represented in whatever yeah. this tattoo is, but I don't know visually how I want it to come together or look or mm -hmm. even wear or anything like that. And I have this huge roadblock there. Yeah. Where it's like, I know what I want it to mean. I don't know mm -hmm. what it looks like. And, and exactly, I'm trying to yeah. cross that chasm somehow. And I don't know, like, what would be your recommendation to me in that process? Because I think maybe other players in the economic community probably have that yeah. process that they're trying to work through and design. It's like, if you have an idea, how do you start adding image to that? 
Yeah, um, for me, a lot, of, a lot of it's just drawing and brain brainstorming. Like one of the things that I learned kind of early in design school, is like an exercise is just like, um, like word mapping. So just like creating associations, like a lot of the time, like, you know, your first idea is not necessarily the best idea, but it usually has some insight because your brain mm. went immediately there. And there's usually like a reason that it went immediately there. Um, and so a lot of the time I try to like, when I first think of a, a design um, or like a concept, I just start like just spewing the words that come to mind, like onto the page and then like starting to associate. It's like, you know, this it connects with this and this connects with that. Mm -hmm. like, why, why am I like thinking about that connection and, and everything? And, um, and also, honestly, it sounds silly, but just like really Google imaging, like the word that you're thinking of or the idea you're thinking of and like seeing what like comes up first, because a lot of the time it, it might either so, like show you what's like a contrived or like, you know, cliched idea, but it also might show you about like, oh, there's like a connection to this idea, which connects mm -hmm. to that idea, which, you know, like helps you like further down the path to like really sorting out like, like what it looks like this concept in your head. So that's often what I do. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting. Are, do, you do, do you do any other designs outside of Kendama? Like, do you do tattoo designs or anything like that for people? Have you ever done that? <laughs> I've never done a tattoo design, okay. um, primarily because I, I do a little bit of illustration, but my strong suit is definitely more like design and graphics and like right. illustration is not like I like doing it, but it's not my strong suit necessarily. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've done a ton of other like I, I mean, again, like, you know, my, my design background is pretty diverse. So I do, mm -hmm. I love doing like lots of different things um, in design, like even just like 3D design and exhibit design and interiors and stuff. I love that kind of stuff, but illustration is not totally my strong suit. There are other people that are like mm -hmm. incredible at that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I, I want to ask a pointed question. If there's mm -hmm. one design that you've ever done with Tara, that is your least favorite that you wish you could go back and redo, which one is it? Oh, it could be a website, it could be Dama, it could be anything. But what is the Honestly, one that you wish you could redo and do it over again? Uh, the very first thing that pops into my head, and if Alex were here, he'd laugh at me. <laughs> it was the very, very first logo for Terra. I always hated it. And it's like, it was one of those things where like, it was one of those, I don't know if you've ever seen it. But if you go back and like watch the, I think it's KE edit, uh, like Nama Edmonton mini edit nine is when we first like, put out any sort of like teaser that like Tara was coming. And that was an example of like your first idea being the idea that you run with where like I was just like in the <laughs> middle of a sketch. I was in the middle of a sketch and kind of showed Alex like halfway through and he's like, it's perfect. Let's run it. Let's go right now. And I'm like, no, I don't. I never want this to see the light of day. And it was the very first like one. And I, I always hated it. And Rod has always laughed at me and joked. He's like, I'm going to get it tattooed like on my palm just because I know you <laughs> And Rod, hate Rod it. would too, right? Rod like... would do it. Yeah, he would definitely do it. And he's like, and I'm going to add a Comic Sans Terra to the no. bottom. I'm like, oh, no. I had one of my profs in, in college. He's one of my favorite people in the world. I love him to bits. But he, yeah. he's written a book in... And it was completely influenced by his daughter. Like it has a great narrative mm -hmm. behind it, but he wrote one of his books and published it with Comic Sans font. Uh, yeah. And it's like a professional business book, but he did it because his daughter <laughs> asked him to. And yeah. it was this whole like, his daughter wanted it to be different and to be fun and to read more yeah. like an approachable book. And he's like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And he published his book with Comic Sans. And I just like, I, <laughs> I was yeah. like, why? Day one in design school, they made us all go into our font books in our computer and delete Comic Sans. They're like, no. this is not allowed. Like Papyrus, I think as well. I was like, no, no, I do not want to see any of this. <laughs> if I ever go pro, I'm making yeah. a Kendama with Comic Sans font all the way around Rod, all of the ring stuff. Right? Rod does it all the time in all of the edits that he's put out. And he, at this point, he, he has said it several times to me. He's like, I do it because I know you hate it so much. And I love it. Like, Rod and I just have that What you got against so Comic like, Sans? Come on. <laughs> what, what is so bad about Comic Sans? Why is it every designer's least favorite font? What is it? Um, what is it? Is it just because you all need to have collectively something to hate on? Is that what it is? Or, or is there actually a reason? 
the yeah it's just um i think like if you really really got technical on it it's just not um like i'm 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 not like a typographer in like the best sense but um it's it's not like actually like laid out the way a lot of like fonts and typefaces are like there's no rhyme or reason to whether like you know the curve of the a matches the curve of the d and like you know that kind of stuff there's a lot of like technical knowledge that goes oh they for I'm, sure just took it out of like a, a three-year-old's like coloring book yeah and just was like oh well, yeah. this, this is cool yeah so i think on a technical level it's like actually that like a lot of work goes into like typographies to be readable legible like you know either like uniform across the letters or mm -hmm. or whatnot um that comic sans doesn't do um and then i think just also on like a grander sta scale it's it's I mean it's it's fun and it's childlike but I think a, a lot of people just see it like a lot of designers also just see it it's used like in lieu of better childish and like playful fonts like it's kind of like the default mm. it's like same thing with papyrus it's like it's like whenever you want like a script looking like font that looks like it's been written on literally a scroll you go for papyrus so I think mm -hmm. it's like I think it's just that it's become like a meme and it's overuse now that it's, it's kind of become like the poster child of just like bad design. <laughs> right. Right. That makes sense. That's cool. Yeah. Um, is there something currently in on the Terra website or in the Terra design architecture of whatever you guys are doing? Yeah. Is there something that you look at now that you want to update and you're like, okay, this needs oh, to be worked man. on. What is one thing that you like as a designer are looking at and being like, I just want to fix that because it would make a big difference. Oh man. Oh, always. I, honestly, like everything, like I, like <laughs> I said, we're always our own worst critics, like yeah. everything, especially cause the other thing is that like design takes time and production takes time. Um, you know, like even before the pandemic, it took a good, like, you know, a few months, six months, maybe even a year to like coordinate like a product release or like a production line, like, especially when you're working with pros and like, communications with other people where you need to get back from their ideas it takes a long time for like this stuff to come out and it's only been extended with the pandemic just slowing everything down so a lot of the time you know like what I have in my head or what I have like you know what we have in the works I often like think you know it's it's published in my view even though no one else has seen it so when I look at what's actually out there like in the world like what our webs like on our website on Instagram mm -hmm. like our products that are published I feel like it's lacking because I know what's coming and like I want to get that out into like the wider world yeah um even though like when people don't you know they don't know what I what we're working on right now so they don't see it so they take it at you know what we have out at face value so right. I think I think there's also just that disconnect that like all of the stuff that we're working on, I'm so, you know, I always want to get it out there. Cause I want it. I'm like, I want people yeah. to see what we're working on right now. Um, uh, but the I lead time on those kind of projects. Time. Yeah. The lead yeah. time on those projects can take forever. And like, you just see the like comments rolling in slowly and you're like, no, I swear we're working on yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Right? So uh. yeah, that's, that's probably more something that's just like, it's always a constant progress of like, Oh, like, you know, the website doesn't have this yet, but it's like in my head, I need to like get it to that point. Yeah. So I wouldn't say there's any one specific thing, but just that process there, in general. Is there a brand out there outside of Kanama that you really look up to for website design or anything like that, that you draw a lot of inspiration from that's helped oh, you guide the, the Terra website? Yeah, honestly, I just, I look at a lot of websites. I don't know if I would say that there's any one particular one that I look at, but I, I just, I look at websites in general just for that. It's like, it could be anything. It could be like a coffee website. It could be like a pen website. It doesn't really mm -hmm. matter, but I, I will notice like, Oh, like this is really like clean looking, or I really like mm -hmm. this like detail of like image and text that they put together. And, mm -hmm. like, or I like the fact that like all of the images have, you know, this kind of lighting, like, you know, I, I look yeah. at that a lot. Um, like definitely no, like, I will say that there's a, a huge uh, disconnect between like North American or like Western websites and like Japanese websites for sure. And I've, we've talked to like people in Japan about this. That, like, I guess in, in Jap like in Japan, I, it's a culture of like, they want to put as much information on the exact same page as possible. Cause mm -hmm. that's, I guess how ja a lot of like Japanese people like to use those websites. 
Um, so like you look at a Japanese website and it's just like wall to wall text and like tiny, tiny little images. And, you know, in North America, we have such a trend of just like really clean, yeah. minimalistic, like just images, very little text. Like, and that's a recent shift different. too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of it is also just like finding other sources and, and knowing like what market you're in. Like if we were to design a website in Japan, I probably like, you know, I would probably design it differently or I would get like consulting, you know, with other people to, to design it differently than I would for like, you know, the North American market, for mm -hmm. example, just because we have those sorts of like, you know, disconnects in like trends. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Some of my favorite websites in terms of design out there that I really look mm -hmm. up to as, as someone who's in e-commerce and I don't do design, but I do a lot of other stuff within digital marketing that's kind of in this space. And I recognize the role design yeah. plays. Uh, I love uh, Wealth, Wealth Simple. They're a Canadian oh, financial yeah. company. Yeah. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with them, but they I, have... I haven't looked at any of their stuff, oh. but I, I definitely know who they are. Like I've you... seen Alex has talked about them. Yeah, oh. I should go check them out. The, well, first off, phenomenal. Down. Yeah, phenomenal yes. brand. They're super cool. Mm -hmm. They're revolutionary. They're like the Robin Hood of Canada, but even yeah. better. They're like, they're like yeah. doing what Robin Hood did, sort of. Their tools mm -hmm. maybe not quite to the same degree as what Robin Hood was doing. Uh, yeah. But their branding and their ethos and their ethics and their culture are just so good. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's like in this moment in history, companies can change. If yeah. people are listening to this five years from now and something comes out, I'm not yeah. saying I'm always advocating. You always got to say that now. You're like, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> stuff lives on. Uh, but well, simple. I really like mm -hmm. HubSpot. HubSpot is oh, a yeah, CRM yeah. Uh, brand yep. out of the mm -hmm. States. I think they're out of Boston. And mm -hmm. they, they are the best at content marketing in the entire world. I think they have right. nailed content yeah. marketing better than any other brand. And then mm -hmm. recently, I've become a really big fan of this supplement brand. And I'm not even really big into supplements, but I just bought that stuff from them because mm -hmm. their brand is so good and they have such a great mm -hmm. user experience. Uh, care of. They're, oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, like, I just yeah. saw, yeah. The yeah, whole awesome. process yeah. from start to finish and like, mm -hmm. I like as a little case study, let, let's talk about this for a second from a design perspective mm -hmm. and how this actually impacted my buyer's journey. And I think this is actually so helpful for someone who's like thinking about starting a brand, starting a business and like thinking about design. It actually plays mm -hmm. such an important role. And it did in my journey of picking care of. Now, first off, mm -hmm. I am not a supplement person. I'm actually like, if, <laughs> if like I, whoever is right. Um, yeah, yeah. But there's people that are like, no, I, I take supplements for this. I use fish oil, vitamin D, whatever. I like mm -hmm. don't, none of it. None of it. I don't, I hardly even use, would ever use protein powder because I'm like, I can get all the things that I need from mother nature and, and like <laughs> eating, eating, but I could just like change my diet and I'll be fine. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, more and more I'm like, okay, maybe I need to succumb to the fact that I live in Canada. We have a vitamin D deficiency up here. There's things we that I can do. definitely supplement. <laughs> right. And so I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm going to give it a shot. Now, I had already followed along care of a little bit. I was influenced, first off, by influencer marketing. There was someone mm -hmm. that I know personally that had introduced me to it. So that was my first touch point in my buyer's journey. Secondly, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, let me take a look at this. I'll go on their website, check it out. First off, their website invites you to take a quiz. They don't even invite you to buy their product right away. They're not even trying mm -hmm. to sell you something. They're actually just trying to educate you. And yeah. this was helpful for me because I am not an educated person when it comes to vitamins or supplements or anything like that. Because mm -hmm. I was like, I ain't putting no pills in my body. I, <laughs> I was always raised on the like, no, you just push through it. You grind through your, your hurts. Oh, and yeah. so you know, cla <laughs> classic Canadians, you know, you just, just grind. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, I'll take the quiz. And they ask you a couple, you know, nice questions. It's very user experience, like to the, to the max. It's so mm -hmm. well done. You come out to the end of it and they're like, based on what you've said, you're looking for help in. It's very about you. Yeah. We yeah. recommend uh, this. This will help you with this and you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I picked these yeah. things because I went through the quiz and, and it pointed it to me. And it's saying mm -hmm. that based on my answers to the things that I want help in, this is how they can yeah. help me. And at the end of Definitely. that funnel, I was like, I, got, I guess I got to buy it. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> if I don't, Perfect I'm not marketing. for me. I'm against right? me if I don't buy it. <laughs> so I did. But more than that. So then after that, okay, so mm -hmm. I order. It comes to my door. It comes in this beautiful box packaging. The box is great. The, the products inside come really, really yeah. nice. And the matte coating on the outside of the, the protein and the collagen and the, the yeah. supplements, super well designed. But then they invite you to download the app. They don't even try and get you to download the app before you get it. 
before yeah. you get the box because they're not trying to overload you with front-loaded info. You mm -hmm. get the box, you download the app, and now you're tracking your supplements, and now you're in their referral program because you're collecting oh, carrots. Yeah. And it's like this oh, whole man. process, it's so well executed. Yeah. I literally lost it. I was like, you guys are doing this so well. <laughs> it yeah, was designed to the I'm, That's Yeah, absolutely. That's like really key. And also, like, also partly like, I think one of the other things is like making those sorts of interactions like genuine really matters because we're all hyper connected in this world right now. We all know that we're being sold to at every moment, even if like, you know, even if we forget, like forget about it in the moment, like we all like understand that. So I think like really like having genuine moments like mm -hmm. is so, I mean, like that's what, that's all that's left in this world is like making sure that those sorts of interactions are are genuine so i think that's a really important thing um, to remember yeah yeah the more that we shift digital the more that we have to recognize the human in the process mm -hmm. and Absolutely. the more human yeah. we can make our digital process the better it'll be and i think kendama mm -hmm. brands and design can learn from that too it's like okay yeah. how do we begin learning to better be human in our processes and mm -hmm. one of the things that tara is doing really uniquely and, and i wanted to ask you about this i chatted with Alex a little bit about this when he was on, but mm -hmm. you guys are doing the custom Terra shop where you're yeah. allowing not only you to be the designer, but now mm -hmm. you're actually empowering the customer to take a role in design themselves. Yeah. And that's been yeah. one of the key pillars of Terra is controlling design in house. You guys make mm -hmm. all your damas in house. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious, like, what has that been like for you as a designer? And are you the one that's like, you know, trying to make the request of that person? Like, what does that journey go through? Yeah, yeah, that was that was a really that was, that was a challenge, like building the custom shop, because I, I really had to like, uh, like get into the, the, the process of like, okay, I know nothing about how to like turn a kendama and I need to just like, step through each like, were like each each step of the process. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> and, um, and like build my own kendama and like get get all the knowledge that I that I can out of it without being overwhelmed and then also couple that with the technical like problem of like how do I like code this into a website in a way that like you know isn't just going to like take me like months and months and months to do this so like you know working with like the again like some kind of like restrictive mm -hmm. like constraints on design of like how can we actually like lay this out on our website um, while also making it like a, you know, a user-friendly experience that people will actually want to go through this and do this. Because mm -hmm. like, if it's too so complicated, people won't do people it. People just like, oh, I don't know. Like, and they would just walk away from it kind of thing. So that, w that was a really unique challenge. And like, I mean, we're still working on it. We're still constantly having like conversations on how can we make it better? How can we improve it? Like, mm -hmm. you know, can we add more features without complicating it even further? And yeah, that that's like a constant ongoing mm -hmm. process, but yeah, it's something that we really pride ourselves on in at Terra. Like we really like we really like love to have a hands on approach and, um, you know, love like, you know, really have like our say in every point of the process and like mm -hmm. and really like letting people know that like these are the human beings behind this. Like we're not just some faceless like corporation mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, it's literally Alex and me like Rod, like partly, and now Max. It's like, we are, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, we are behind this and like, we're just trying to make it work as we go kind of thing. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, you know, that helps like, you know, view the idea that like, you know, it's also human beings buying from us too. So, mm -hmm. you know, having that connection is, is important. Mm -hmm. Do you see the custom shop being the future of, of Terra Kanama? Do you see that being the like, the core of what Terra is, is custom made? I see it I see it being a really important like core, like it's foundational to like who why we started like Terra or like well why Alex started Terra and why mm -hmm. like I kind of came on board is that we like Alex just bought a lathe and tried to figure out how to make a kendama himself and like be a part mm -hmm. of that so um I I mean it's also hard to continue to run a business and make rent off of only hand turned kendamas as well yeah. so you know, it can't be the only thing that we ever do. Um, and, and it, it shouldn't either. Like, you know, we want to like make a ton of different kendamas and we want, you know, people to be mm -hmm. able to enjoy our kendamas no matter how much they can afford as well as the other thing. But, um, mm -hmm. I do see it as being very foundational to like, this is like, you know, our identity at Terra and Alex like really still loves making kendamas himself. He loves doing that process. So, I don't see it going away any anytime soon. It's it's really a part of like who Tara is.
So. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the key pillars of what makes Terra different mm -hmm. than every other company out yeah. there because there's so few brands out there that are able to hand turn Kanamas and make custom mm -hmm. requests. There's a few in the States, there's like Evo Kanamas, but, uh, mm -hmm. and, and Evo isn't doing quite the same thing that you're doing because you have even yeah. taken that a step further in doing like resin based Kanamas and yeah. and starting to, to do a lot of other unique stuff there or acrylic spikes and all this. And it's like, you're really mm -hmm. trying to innovate the capabilities of what can be created with a Kanama. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I know even like our friend Sean has been really integral to that too. Like he's, he's just been around and like, he works in like the film industry. So he's got his own like whole other side. He's a carpenter as well by trade. Um, but he's been really innovative and stuff like he, um, he put together a kendama that was made almost entirely of just sheets of newspaper, just like glued together. And it was wow. like, not very durable, like the spikes started to like split on it, but like incredible, like innovation of just material and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he and Alex have like collabed on a ton of stuff, including Terraply. That's, that's their project. To the oh, other. interesting. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, like that's definitely been something we've tried to push for a long time. It's just like, what are like, what can a Kendama actually be? Like it, does it have to be made mm -hmm. out of wood? Does it have to be this type of wood? Like, you know, pushing those limits of just like our own creation is has mm -hmm. been really amazing. <laughs> it's been fun. What has been one of the biggest challenges of running the business uh, of Terra, both like on a personal and business side, like as business owners, I know that that's a stressful thing. Uh, when you're, mm -hmm. when your income is dependent on how well yeah. you can run your business and it's yep. not just like a job that you're guaranteed hourly pay on. It's like, yep. <laughs> how, how do you handle that on like um, the personal and business side? For a long time, especially before, like, you know, say Rod or like Max came along, like weekends didn't really exist for us because it's kind of like rent is the same price no matter what, you know, and when you're self-employed, like you got to make sure that you, like, you can you can eat and put food on the table mm -hmm. and have a place to live. And so, um, you know, and it's also your baby, like, you know, it's like this is like your thing and you're trying to like have it grow mm -hmm. up. So um definitely like challenges with just like work life balance for sure, which uh, we're, we've gotten a lot better at, but like, I think everyone struggles with that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that was a huge challenge. Just like making sure that um, just the logistics of like making sure that Tara can run doesn't like completely overwhelm all of the really fun, amazing parts. Like, you know, yeah. getting to design Kendamas and play Kendama and like have events like, you know, we need to do the other stuff to make sure the lights stay on, but like making sure that that doesn't overwhelm, mm -hmm. you know, the really fun and what really makes Kendama fun. So th those are really tough challenges when you're self-employed um, yeah. or running your own business and, and then extra challenges when suddenly you have an employee and like now, now you're not only someone else is in, depending like, on yeah, you. You're not, you're not just invested in making sure you can eat, but like that, you know, the people who are working with you and for you can also eat and, and feel empowered, feel like they yeah. have a voice. Um, I think that's really important. Like, you know, they're not just like our lackeys to just be like, oh, go do this, go do that. But that they really have a say in shaping, like, you know, the direction that we go in. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important to, to ensure. Yeah, that, that's such a like mindset of entrepreneurship that is so hard to attain. And, it, mm -hmm. and it's scary. It's risky to run a it, business. It is risky. It's hard. Yeah. Especially, especially when other people are depending on you. It's like, it's okay when it's just you. Like yeah. I, I wholesale Kendamas for, for soul Kendamas. Mm -hmm. And I, like, mm -hmm. I bear all the risk in it. Uh, and, yeah. and that's fine. But if I had someone mm -hmm. working for me, it's like, okay, I guess I got to pull my shorts up and, and get my, my yeah. button gear because it's like, okay, someone else is, you know, someone else's ability to live and eat food mm -hmm. and survive is in part dependent on me. It's like, yeah, that's a scary yeah. place to be. And that's kind of the like maturing stage of a business, right? When you start mm -hmm. hiring other people, it's like, this is a whole nother level of serious. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. But you guys have also like taken it really in a different direction than a lot of other Kanama brands where you're manufacturing your own. You guys have a shop mm -hmm. that you pay rent for and all these things that are, mm -hmm. you know, big expenses as compared to- In a very expensive city. <laughs> in a very expensive city. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, there are a whole other, you know, onset of expectations and stuff in the economic community for costs and stuff like that. And, and, uh, you know, some of that being like the, the price of a Kanama and you guys have so many of these other costs that go into it, but yet you do everything yeah. in house. You've held that integrity. You don't do everything. You obviously have some yeah. trying to make, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, products, but, but generally doing a lot of this in-house, you have a lot of other costs that are there that are different than other brands that are just getting China made mm -hmm. products and they're more the brand face of it. They're not doing any of the manufacturing. It's a totally different operation that you guys are running. And I'm mm -hmm. just freaking proud of what you guys have done oh, as a you. Canadian. Like, <laughs> I, I'm just honored that you guys have been able to achieve that. You're at a place now where you're hiring people. You're running a business very successfully, whether or not it, at least from the outside, I've been yeah, so stoked yeah. to see the growth oh, of Terracanoma this year in particular, you know, personally, I'm mm -hmm. just stoked. Like a, yeah. as someone who loves business, B, as someone who's just proud of Canada, C, as someone who just like loves Tarek and Dom and what you guys are doing, I'm just stoked. <laughs> and and I just you. want to kind of like give you guys a collective like, hey, keep going. I love what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's hard work. It's, I don't know, it might look easy from the outside, but there's a lot of work that goes on <laughs> behind the scenes. It is not thank easy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I want to just ask like two more questions. We'll wrap it mm -hmm. up. You got to get to pitch and putt and go kick my boy Max's butt in it. <laughs> Because uh, I know that he, he needs... I think he Alex needs... is more likely to kick himself than <laughs> I am. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, question here from Lem and Lime. Are there any unique design trends or styles that you've noticed to be specific in the Kanama community? Anything that you see evolving going forward? Hmm. I, don't, hmm, I don't know. Like specifically like Kanama designs or... Uh, I honest, I'm I'm just really excited at the fact that like Kendama designs are getting so much more complex, I guess. Um, it used to literally just be stripes, like that's it. Like, you know, and it's like, oh, you got two stripes on this one. Like, whoa, like that's crazy. <laughs> the day it went yeah. from solids to stripes yeah. was a big day for Kendama. A big day or like a half split, <laughs> big day. Um, but now just like... Um, I like, you know, and like it went from like that to then like flat pattern designs, like which I, I honestly love. I love like really flat restrictive color designs because it really like forces you to like abstract ideas and like, you know, under again, like accentuate the really fundamental aspects of like an illustration or a design rather than just like hyper realism. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I would say that like on the whole, Kendama has like design has been very like young playful fun um you know all these things are are great but i, I really do like the fact that a lot of like the kendama, kendama design like lately has been maturing a little bit like for the longest time it was like we honestly considered it like suicide to put out like a gray kendama <laughs> like you know like i wanted to do that for so long and alex was like mm -hmm. absolutely not we cannot do that no one like everyone buys like red green blue <laughs> like that's what they mm -hmm. buy um and so to see like kendama designs like jake's like jake weens is yeah. a pro model and some of the chrome stuff that like it's literally like black and like you know beige and neutral like color tones and stuff like I stuff love that I've, those like, colors I love them because it's it's stuff that I like you know I've really wanted to do for a long time but we just never felt like you know it would it would be popular enough to actually warrant doing it's like oh no it's like no one will buy it and you know mm -hmm. when you're running a small business like that's almost suicide to put out like yeah. a product that no one buys um and so I think that's a that's a trend that I'm like really seeing in the Kendama community. I don't know if it's unique to the Kendama community, but I think it's a good one for sure to just see that there's now space to have both the really, really bright, vibrant, colorful, fun, mm -hmm. you know, childlike Kendama's like designs and also the really like mature, like refined, understated mm -hmm. design Kendamas. I, I'm really happy to start seeing that there's room for that now yeah yeah hey, i i've loved the evolving you know i like seeing the thematic kendamas the ones that mm -hmm. have like a theme and they're not just like hey here's a new colorway we came up with it's red yeah or blue yeah. but when you know like even uh this was native's kendama that they just came out with mm -hmm. uh the espresso and it, obviously like yeah. I'm, I'm a coffee nerd i was like yeah, instant i need this right uh, yeah, and, yeah. and i love that they they took something that's real and then and then adapted it into a kendama and mm -hmm. they did that well and they more than that created a whole brand package with it by having the espresso yeah. and the macchiato and a, and a mug and i was like okay that's really very great cool. marketing great branding yeah, very cool. sweets kendamas does it now uh, especially with their v series and they, mm -hmm. they take themes from real life and then abstract them into kendamas uh you know yeah. i love when that is like the mentality is like when you bring Definitely. something that is like yeah 
you know, something that people see in real life and then are able to mm -hmm. adapt it into something. And one of the, one of the domas that I think design wise was one of the coolest things Tara ever came out with were the battle scar kendamas because it was, oh, yeah. it was something that yeah. had a narrative to it. It was like a, mm -hmm. it was a doma that had a deeper meaning than just like having a colorway. It was like, Definitely. no, the more yeah. you play this, the more it's scarred and you will see that. was see Alex's that. idea. He loved that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think it's a really cool idea. Yeah. And, and totally. And it comes all down to the design piece. Uh, mm -hmm. One quick question here from Spiffy mm -hmm. Toys. And then we'll ask one last question from Takana, one of our friends from Ecuador, uh, yeah. that is a regular listener of the show. And then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up here. And I have yeah. been so grateful for this conversation. I love mm -hmm. nerding out on design. I think this is so helpful for some of the entrepreneurs in the community that are trying mm -hmm. to understand like, how do I make something that people will appreciate and gaining yeah. some of the tools and to be able to do that. Oh. Sorry, I'm yeah. low on battery. Yeah, that's okay, uh, that's but, okay. Uh, Spiffy, uh, Selvia, she's a Canadian distributor. Mm -hmm. She does a lot of design work herself. She hand burns uh, Kanamas and then sells Yeah, them. we got one from her, that was incredible. Yeah, so she's amazing. <laughs> she's fantastic, love her a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, she wants to know, are we going to see Jumbo Pills again? A quick little terror oh, question. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, we've been working on that for sure. We're, we're trying. Um, we don't have any sort of, like plans immediately right on the horizon, but we're definitely talking about it. So, yeah, ch check back with us in a, in a bit. But, yeah, we're, we're definitely like on, on trying to get them back for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, well, before I actually ask this Takona question, uh, I know that mm -hmm. there was a post put on the tariff feed just recently you know, mm -hmm. uh, teasing the date of 2805. So coming up in, yeah. in five days, something's coming yeah. out. Are, are you able to give yes. us any, any hints or details? Uh, all I can say is it's just, it's a project we've been working on for a long time, which again, with just like this world, like of the pandemic has really like slowed down stuff, but like it's here and we're excited to, to have it come out and have you see it all. So that's all I can give you, but we are, it is, it is exciting. It's something that we've okay. wanted to put up for a long time. So stay tuned for that. I, I am very excited. I've been mm -hmm. very impressed with everything you guys have been doing this year. One of the things in particular that I'm really stoked about, I put in a custom order myself for something yeah. from Tara Ooh, recently. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm waiting for that to come through. And it's, uh, it's kind of a, a, a secret. Well, is that it right there? Yeah, I've got it right here for you. It's already done. Yeah. Oh yeah, my we gosh. finished it. We finished it like uh, I think Alex finished it yesterday, and he was like, "Oh, I could I could ship it out, or I could like keep it so you can show it." And oh, it's that's coming so to you. cool! Yeah. Oh. Okay, so for <laughs> those that don't know what that is, can you can you tell the the world? That's oh so, man, I didn't know yeah. it was done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a it's a mini pill, it's a, like walnut, um, but the spike is some kind of like acrylic like I, I actually don't know Alex Alex can tell me what it's filled with but it's coffee beans like yeah. literal coffee beans like cast in some kind of like acrylic or resin and it smells like coffee it's it's crazy because it's literal beans so yeah. I'm yeah. so excited for probably that. I... not the most durable but like really incredible oh, yeah. looking so I'm probably yeah, not gonna play go. it all that much but it's definitely going up behind yeah. me in the review set for yeah. sure uh, because that is so cool when Al I think Alex sent me a photo he's like yo look what I got in the yeah. shop I was like Alex say no more what can I get made with that he's like well I don't know if it's going to be that durable and I was like what what can we do I don't yeah. even know if I'm going to play with it that much but nonetheless I was like I need that and it, oh, yeah, so there you so go just oh. finished like yesterday <laughs> that's so cool yeah yeah man oh that yeah, was a nice surprise yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, uh, last question, and we'll, we'll yeah. put a bow on this here. Uh, mm -hmm. Takana.Kanama underscore EC, uh, Ecuadorian player and community leader. How do you motivate more girls to be a part of the community? What, what is a strategy that people can take? And I actually want to know this too, because here's, here's mm -hmm. the thing. We have this Calgary com community, so I'll, I'll re rephrase this even yeah. for myself. We have the Calgary community that's starting to grow, and we have a 100% male-dominated community right now. And you know, part of it is just like, that's just what we've been dealt. That's the, the hand that we've been mm -hmm. given here. Yeah. And yeah. I think it is hard for me to know, like, and be invitational to women. And in, in the fact yeah. that, like, it's like, okay, if there aren't any other women for them to come and join and be there, it's like, I'm worried that they won't have a great experience. And I don't want to invite someone into an experience that they may not feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you kind of want there to be some sort of an adoption first before you can start inviting other people in. What, yeah. what do I do? How do you... <laughs> how yeah. can I learn? Oh man, I, 
that's it's it's a tough question like really for the longest time like what I just always saw for me because I you know I am a woman like was just being like yeah and I've talked to Haley about this a lot is like just us being there was like a statement it's like okay by us being there you know more women will come like we you know we are going to create the space for women to be there um and I think part of it is also just like um, just, you know, talking to women, like, I, I know I've definitely been guilty of this before when Haley and I have said, like, you know, been at competitions and said, are you going to compete? And I'm like, mm, I don't know, like, I, I, I don't really want to be up on stage. I don't really want to take the space. And she's like, you should compete. You should do it kind of thing. And it's, you know, not, not in like a peer pressure way, but in a like, you know, you are capable of doing it. Like, so like, you know, show the world that you're capable mm -hmm. of doing it. Um, so I think like creating, like, for me, it was about like, you know, creating space, like by just, you know, having one woman there to say like, hey, where are the rest of the women? Come on, come, come on out. We are here. Um, like, we want more of us to be seen. Um, and also, again, this is another thing where like, I kind of like, I, I didn't really think this way until, you know, other women in the community kind of showed me that like, you know, this is also important is also like, I, it sounds obvious, but literally putting it on like, the on posters or putting it in the space of like women are welcome come on out please come join us like you know if you got like if you have like if all the guys that are in that scene like if they have girlfriends get them to bring them you know like get get women out in that space and give them like show them that they're capable like i've, I've seen so many at so many like booths and like we've done a ton of like you know public like um events and festivals and stuff where we'd have a booth and like um so often it's like you know I, I, like a guy and girl like you know when, like girlfriend boyfriend are walking past and they go oh what is this kendama thing and we're like try it out here here's a kendama the guy instantly picks it up and is like yeah i'll do it i'll try oh blah blah and the, yeah. and the woman says no i'm bad at that and huh. you say have you ever tried it before no no but i know i'm bad at it um mm. And I've always hated to hear that because I'm like, no, yeah. you don't even know. You got to give it the space. Yeah. So oh. I think just like, you know, getting, just saying like, just come on out, like bring your girlfriend, bring your sister, bring people along and like yeah. giving them the encouragement that this is, this is a space that it's okay to make a mistake. It's, you don't have to be perfect the first time you try it. Um, and just saying that like, you know, you, you we want you here. So yeah. I, I think just being like, vocal and proactive about it um and for the women that do come out encouraging them like bring your friends like you know so i i think that's like speaking directly to that to us to to women to them is is important as well yeah. in ways that i didn't particularly think before i didn't think that for a long time but i i think it is important yeah and i think kendama's <laughs> learning like we're getting better at being yeah. more accepting obviously we've had struggles and obviously these are things that have been discussed recently in the kendama community about how mm -hmm. we can be more engaging and and yeah. more respectful and inviting to and, you know non-identifying players people that mm -hmm. come from all backgrounds anyone yeah, to, to make kendama a very inclusive and welcoming space and, mm -hmm. and i think it's always you know a posture that i want to take of like how can i learn uh mm -hmm. to be a more inviting person because i i recognize that like maybe maybe I'm intimidating to some people and I can actually be someone that pushes away people because I've been in it for so long that mm -hmm. maybe I'm not the best person to invite someone who's a new player into the community at all times because I've been playing for six years. Someone mm -hmm. sees me and if I'm just chilling, I'm like doing whatever tricks on the side that seem way out of reach to someone. It's like, maybe I'm not actually the best person to invite someone new in and because mm -hmm. I, I can come across as overwhelming or, oh, I'm that guy who runs the podcast, he, blah, 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 or whatever. It's like there's all these barriers there. I'm like, okay, maybe how how can I learn? How can I be better mm -hmm. at being more welcoming yeah. and inviting to new players? And I think everybody needs to take that posture. And I think you gave some really good advice there and wisdom. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, just be welcoming, be inviting, and be willing to take the risk to be humble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like allowing people. To, I think a lot of people <clears throat> are intimidated because they just see they just see people like you know, at least for me as well, I knew as a woman, like, you know, I was, into, I was like, oh, all the guys are so much better than I am. Like, oh, I don't know if I want to like, really do like, because you know, like, I, we're all kind of like, at our core, like afraid of making mistakes. And, and yeah. just like, you know, well, it's embarrassing being right? shown to be vulnerable. Um, and so I think part of it is also just saying like, it's, oh, you know, this is a space where we can be vulnerable. This is a space where we can make a mistake. We don't have to be perfect at this. Like, yeah. you know, and I think that's, that really came from, 
from like viewing so many of those festivals where women are like, I've never tried this, but I know I'm bad at it already. And I'm just not yeah. even going to try. It's like, that hurts you know, to hear that. Like, even for yeah. me, I'm like, I yeah. hate that someone would be so defeated yeah. before they've even tried something to think that they can't yeah. do it. Exactly. Right. So I think me. that's really key to it as well as like, you know, having people that like, you know, like me, like being a woman in that situation to be like, I'm no, I know you can do this. I know you can do this. And like, you know, I'm, I'm visually like representing to you that I know you can do this kind of thing, you know, having that, like, you know, having someone who is like you to mirror back to and say, no, they're, they're here. I yeah. can be here too, kind of thing. So it is a bit, again, it's like, it's a wheel in motion. It's like, yeah. you know, the more momentum you get, the the easier it gets, but it's just making, getting that first step of like getting someone in the community yeah. to, to be the, the vocal, like, you know, visual that like we can be here and we can do this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and us as players, we have a, an opportunity in those moments too, where we can kind of step up to the plate or we can, we can kind of passively mm -hmm. just like let it slide. Right. Like when, when yeah. someone comes up to me and they're like, Oh, I'm no good. I, I, I don't think I can do it. And, and they shy away from it. We have mm -hmm. an option right there as yeah. players yes, to either choose yeah. to engage in that conversation or be like, okay, yeah, no, that's fine. You don't have to try. And, yeah. and I think sometimes we think that the easy way out is to do that second thing and say like, Oh mm -hmm. no, we don't want to come across as like we're pressuring or peer pressuring or that's, anything like that's that. That's the thing. It's it's a fine line. You don't want to like peer pressure people, yeah. but you want to give them the space to say, "No, I can do this." Yeah. But I think yeah, I think if we if we were to take like nine maybe maybe not in all cases, we we probably will make this mistake, but I think more often than not if we were to take the moment and say, "Actually, no, seriously, just just try here." I uh, mm -hmm. I let, would you would you be okay if I taught you how to do the big cup? I'd love to teach yeah. you or whatever it is. Yeah. And, invite them into that process humble yourself to go into that conversation be willing to mm -hmm. be a fool be will be willing to be embarrassed personally uh, yeah. and and be a teacher and i think if we yeah. all took that posture just a little bit more seriously we would mm -hmm. see such a beautiful growth in this community yeah. of new players yeah, that we never would have expected yeah i agree yeah but definitely with all that said hey we have been going <laughs> for a little while here yeah. You need to get to pitch and putt. And I, I am just grateful <laughs> that you have taken the time to be on here and share a bit of your story. Uh, invite us into the journey of someone who has done a lot of behind the scenes work in Kanama in really building what Tara Kanama is today. Tara would not be what it is. Let's be honest, with Smith time, Tara Kanama <laughs> would not be what it is today if not for Kristen Olenek in the background doing what she does, uh, keeping everything coordinated, running, and keeping my boy Kanama Max Angel employed. Let's be real. <laughs> you would not be where you are yeah. with Tarek and Nama if you weren't playing a significant role there. I think you have an incredible you. influence in this space. Uh, thank you for all that thank you've you. done. Uh, thank you for coming on here and being willing to mm -hmm. share some of your story. And we are very grateful and appreciative. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's a bit, it was a bit intimidating, I will admit, to jump right back into like live Instagram like after nothing. But I am extremely glad I did it. And thank you for having me. Okay. An absolute privilege. Thank you to everybody who tuned in today. Uh, as always, uh, we like to wrap up our, our episodes by asking the, the, the person who's being interviewed, mm -hmm. you know, if there was a piece of wisdom that you would like to impart into the Kanama community, a few final words oh. that you'd like to say, what, what would those be? Um, know that your, you and your voice have influence, no matter how much you, you might think that you don't. Um, you might think that nobody knows about you or whatever, but, uh, in whatever small chunk of community that you can actually control, you have influence and your voice and your presence matter. So, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I, I wrote a quote down from, and I don't even remember who quoted it, but I remember reading it in a book like a year, a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this when we were going into this interview. Uh, it was a leader is anyone who inspires someone to follow. You are a leader, yeah. no matter what size oh, of following thanks. you have. Yeah. If, if you, yeah you have the empower mm -hmm. the empowered ability to inspire someone to, to follow yes. so absolutely take it love what you've said here kristen today thank you so much uh for yeah, jumping on here you. and mm -hmm. thank you to you guys who have tuned in here today remember next week is the one year anniversary of the brewview podcast uh we are doing something special if you are a patreon member you are going to get early access to that episode in a video format this is not a live recording that will be coming out just on the patreon a week ahead of time, and then will be released to the public a week later. So if you want access to that conversation of an interview of me, 
Uh, make sure you sign up for the Brewview Patreon, the Cafe Canoma Patreon for $5 a month and get all the behind the scenes access. I've spieled that a lot. So uh, you guys already know the deal. <laughs> Anyways, thank you again so much, Kristen, and go enjoy yeah. Pitch and Putt. And thank you to you guys who have tuned in today. Yeah. Thank you. Peace.